Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I mean, we are back on track, which is thanks to all those speakers who helped. And I think this morning session, I am pretty happy about it. And um, I hope everybody is. Um, so we have about 10 minutes. If anybody has a question, I send a chat message asking if you have a question, you can type it up on the chat box or you can type Q question mark and we'll unmute you so you can ask the question verbally. Um, at least uh, the next talk is at 1.15. Uh, Sparkle is going to moderate this session and, and also Q&A session with me. So uh, anybody has a question? Uh, I think some are still coming back after lunch. Okay, Tom, uh, Tom Chaika has a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you unmute him, uh, Maria or Sparkle? Okay. I unmuted myself, that's okay. Okay, good, 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 good. I think you have that privilege as a speaker, that's good. Go ahead and ask the question, Tom. Sure, I had a, a question for Sam Brody, if he's still around. Um, <clears throat> I really enjoyed that. Uh, 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 TDIS presentation and um, in the presentation you, you talked about that the challenge of you know bridging the gap between the modelers, the researchers, and the decision makers. That's something that uh, we're always working on and often struggle with sometimes. You know, um, at least here in Nuracuz. I was just curious if you had any um, best practices, uh, processes, you know, methods that. I, and I know you guys are kind of uh, sort of spinning up, but any any guidance on what seems to work well in terms of, you know, eliciting those requirements, you know, from the stakeholders and then transitioning those into requirements for the modelers and researchers through that process. Yeah. Uh, thanks. thanks. Thank you for your comments. We, we came up with a, I call it a conceptual model um, where, we're trying to um, go from knowledge to action and that bridge. And there were four, what I call segues to help bridge that gap that kind of permeates everything we're doing. Let's see if I can remember them. Um, hang on. One is the data analytics. And that's meant to draw in uh, people like Ali M who was on today's call, who is a modeler and a scholar, but his goal is to create change and the research comes along the way. And it's not for everybody. Um, so it's finding those people and using data analytics as a lens to bridge that gap. The second is visualization. So it's we're finding that the ability to um, not just create data and results, but to visualize that, um, particularly given the way the type of data we're using and the technology available is really powerful as a second segue. The third was communication. And that's where, you know, the visualization when it's implemented to different stakeholders is communicating the risk or the impact or the hazard. Um, and we do that verbally and graphically and you know and at different means. And the fourth kind of overall segue we call learning. And it, learning is often early, often and ongoing. Um, and it's not just um, coming up with a model or a result and then going into a community and doing what they call engagement and doing a workshop. And so here, it's kind of an announce and defend approach. Here's what we've done. Um, what do you think? We have this project now where we produce these initial outputs and I go in a room and say, okay, tell me why it's wrong. 
and we get that kind of genuine two-way feedback. And I literally like walk in with a map and say, right on the map, show me all maps are wrong. What's really going on? And we then take that information, we feed it back into the models and recalibrate them and then go back to the communities. And so this learning, constant learning, I think is super important. I've gotten lucky in TDIS because, you know, we could really demonstrate that the, the, the seed of the idea came from the people who want to use it. Um, I think if it was through a funded, you know, a Kopi grant and it was a bunch of experts say, this is what you need, it would be much harder. In this case, it was, it came from the users like, we need this. And then I kind of stoked the fire. I'm like, look at Iowa, University of Iowa and their flood info system. And Larry Weber, um, who sits on our steering committee, is a real inspiration. There's other examples around the um, the country. There's there's no better way to motivate a Texan as if you bring in a California example. <laughs> um, <laughs> because for some reason, I don't, I'm not from Texas originally, but California really like gets me stirred up. Um, so I, I hope that's kind of answers your questions. There's a lot of little things in between. Um, this is not for everyone. And one of my challenges is trying to find the people on both sides, but really the, in the academic realm who are, you know, see, see their role as, as all of you, I think on this call, um, <laughs> making a positive change using research data science. There's a lot of people who it ends with the research. For us, the research comes along the way as you create change and action. Thanks, Sam. I, I appreciate all that detail. Yeah, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Thank and you. I'm happy to talk offline too. Okay, great. I might, are there I any other questions? Are there any other questions from anyone else? You just have to type Q and we will unmute you, or you can unmute yourself, or that's a question. Otherwise, we can move on to the next session, and I will hand it over to um, Sparkle. Before we get started, um, Jim, it looks like we're seeing you in presenter view um, instead of full screen for your presentation. Oops. Uh, let's see. Uh, where did I, I think, find that? You know, I think you, you have to select the right screen when you share the screen. Maybe you share the. You can have, also go to the display settings drop down, and there's a swap option. Display settings drop down. Oh, you were there. You were there. Left, right? Yeah. So, option. Second one. No. no oh. No. Uh, Second menu item. Second, display settings. Yeah. That one? Yeah. Oh, come on. Damn it. <laughs> uh, oh, God. It's a, okay, it's wait a minute. drop down. Yeah. Oh, shit. Excuse I think, me. Uh, yeah, some kind of arrow going on there. That yeah, that's because I, put, I, I, did, uh, I did drawing tools so that I could show this arrow. Ah. Uh, Gerald, so what are you see? What are you seeing on re remotely? What are you seeing? Are you seeing at least this part? We do see your main screen, but we also see your next slide. Oh yeah. Oh. Oh geez. I don't know how to how to get this uh, drawing arrow to go away. How about if you hit the escape? Take it away, maybe. Uh, oh. Okay. Now, now maybe make it full screen again and see. What does that look like? Um, now right? we can see what looks to be your desktop, and so we can see that you have PowerPoint open in your presentation. There, it's just not in presenter view. Okay. Um, all right, so, oh gosh. Um, if you go to the slideshow, you might be able to 
um, go to uh, the settings for your slideshow and then um, choose a single uh, screen for your presentation. A single screen for my presentation, slideshow. Slideshow. At the top of uh, PowerPoint. Yeah, um, from current slide. Um, and so once you um, click on slideshow at the top, where you see file, home, insert, design, at the top of your PowerPoint um, window. Okay. Oh, there you go. There you go. You can just go Is that back it? Now. Yep. It's yep. Perfect. Is that it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let me see. All right. Okay. Whew. Um, I, I, if if Tiffany is there, I'm going to apologize right now for not talking about the Everglades work that we are we are doing. Uh, instead, I'm going to talk about this project that I'm I'm doing with Sam Chapman, Adam Lang Langley, and others on the northward migration of mangroves. Um, near the near Jacksonville is actually where they are, and this this photo on the left is what this place looks like, and you what you're looking at there is is a a black mangrove Avicennia germ germanans that's invading this marsh. On the right is North Inlet, where um, for 30 years I've been developing this marsh equilibrium theory and the, and the marsh equilibrium model. So this was the birthplace of this. And the challenge to me, I'm the modeler in this group. Sam Chapman is the, is the PI. Um, the challenge to me was to try and model this and to bring or to adapt marsh equilibrium theory to mangroves. So I want to take you through first what this theory is, is about. And uh, oops, gosh. Um, I'm having trouble advancing. Uh, there we go. Okay. So the, the first observations I made, um, gosh, 30, 30 years ago, was that the productivity in the marshes was responding to anomalies in mean sea level. And when sea level was anomalously high in the summer months during the growing season, you had higher productivity in these sites that I was monitoring. Um, and subsequently, we've been measuring, we measured uh, the, the full response uh, using, these, using these marsh organ devices to grow little mesocosms at different elevations within the tide, within the tidal frame. And what we see is a response that looks like this. I mean, it looks like a parabola. It doesn't have to be symmetrical. Uh, it often is not, but um, I, I would posit that any plant that grows within the tides um, has a response like it looks something like this. There's, a, there's a, an elevation that's too high or a depth that's too low. I use depth because um, sedimentation is proportional to depth. Depth will mean high water. So there's a um, there's a there's an elevation that's too high, and osmotic stress gets the plants. And there's a um, an elevation that's um, too great, or a depth that's too high, uh, where uh, hypoxia gets them. And there's a sweet spot in the middle. So that's reasonably well developed. We've done this in a number of places. People in China have done mangroves, so we know that. This all works out pretty well. And the next step in this was to, we started measuring um, marsh elevations because I was seeing a, a long-term increase in the productivity of these marshes. And I reasoned that if, if uh, more flooding uh, produced higher productivity, then the long-term trend and in increasing productivity must mean that the marshes are not keeping up with sea level. So I started measuring elevations of the marshes using these uh, sediment erosion tables. And I, I set up a fertilization experiment 
to test the idea that uh, adding nitrogen in particular would decrease the elevation because it would decrease it would increase decomposition well that's not what happened uh, the elevation in the fertilized plots increased much much faster than in the controls so the controls here are doing about a, a, a millimeter a year so these they're not keeping up with sea level so the original uh, hypothesis was correct. They're not keeping up with sea level, but if you increase productivity by fertilizing, you increase the accretion rates. And that, that was really a an epiphany because that, you know, I got it. That's how they keep, that's how marshes keep up with sea level. When, when, they, uh, when the level rises, the productivity rises, they accrete more sediment and the elevation rises, and there's an equilibrium that's set up. So that all led to this first very simple parsimonious marsh equilibrium model. And the idea is really simple. I mean, using this simple geometry here where you have a flat marsh platform at some depth D below mean high water, and you have mean sea level here, the, the accretion rate is, is proportional to the depth. Uh, the depth is proportional to the sedimentation rate, and the depth determines productivity. Okay, so so the so the accretion rate is proportional to and to biomass as well. You when you have higher biomass, you have more accretion. So you combining this, you get you get this little equation here. You know this is these are these are parameters. This is biomass here. This is depth. But then we also know that. The biomass is a function of depth. You know, we have this parabolic function. Okay, and then when you do the substitution, when you when you substitute biomass uh, for um, for the depth in that equation, you you end up with. Uh, sorry, when you when you substitute for for d with with that biomass function, you you come up with this simple little equation here. And if, if you assume that the marsh is rising in equilibrium with sea level and where R is the rate of sea level rise, then you've got this equation here, which, which you can then solve this. You can solve this. You can calculate what is the equilibrium depth for any, for any R or for any rate of sea level rise. And you get this fascinating solution here. And the generalities from this are still valid. Uh, but this comes from that super simple model. Uh, what this shows is as the rate, as a function of the rate of sea level rise, this is the equilibrium depth here. And I've done it for uh, two hypothetical systems that differ in tidal amplitude. So here's a microtidal site, here's a mesotidal like, like North and like here. There is a, there's a portion here that, that is stable, and then there's a portion here that is unstable. So, and likewise, there's a, an equilibrium production rate that corresponds to different uh, rates of sea level rise. So there is an optimal rate of sea level rise for primary production, and that's, that's a pretty neat idea. Uh, the, and the dynamic range of response increases with increasing tidal amplitude. Um, that's, that also is pretty cool. And that's, those are still valid generalities. So the, Current version of them has come a long way. The, the underlying theory is still the same, but there's a lot more detail in it. And uh, al although I've tried to keep it as user friendly and, and as simple as possible, the idea is to tr to try and uh, model these complex systems with as uh, with as few a number of inputs as as is possible and uh, as simple as possible. These inputs, um, you know, the, the people on the ground, and I'm one of them who collect these kinds of data are, will tell you this is not simple stuff coming up with these numbers, but, but the point is you can measure these things. So there are various physical inputs and biological inputs. And one of the most important is this this growth curve that you see here in the in the upper left, that's really critical to the way 
this model behaves in the way I think real, real systems behave. So, so the original model for a long time had one growth curve that was a one species model. Um, but then adding mangroves, it, it you know, uh, I was informed, um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. If I solve this model for North Inlet for, for three different sea level rise scenarios, one that's rising at 40 centimeters, 180, one, and one at 100 centimeters in 100 years, I get these results. Um, this is the standing biomass over time. And the, the 40 centimeter uh, simulation shows that they do pretty well um, at 40 centimeters, but at, at 80, they, the marsh is really starting to decline and, and they don't survive 100, they crash. And here's the relative elevation versus time showing uh, how, you know, how fast the decline is. And so even at 40 centimeters, they are losing relative elevation. And, you know, that's, we've got measurements to, to back this up. And if you, if you plot the standing biomass versus the relative elevation, this is kind of interesting. So here's that theory, and the model starts off here at that elevation, and the 40 centimeters uh, simulation advances to this position here. So it's moving over to the unstable side. This is the unstable side of this growth curve. The 80 centimeter simulation, the marsh moves to this position, and, and at in the 100 centimeter simulation, the marsh crashes. Now, um, so to to model mangroves, especially to model the expansion the, uh, of mangroves on the, at their border, I had to model age dependent growth. You know, they start off as one year plants and then they they mature. So. The people on the ground doing surveys and, and so on uh, came up with these growth curves that you see here. So this this small one, these are the these are the one year plants, and they've got a maximum biomass of about about 500 grams per square centimeter uh, per per meter square, and then uh, in 30 years, they, they grow to this position. So their range expands, their vertical range expands, as well as the biomass. And the, the actual biomass of the plants themselves, this is the 40 centimeter simulation here. The red, the red line here is a trace of how the plant grows. And so over 30 years, it moves in this direction, increasing elevations there. So these are the three uh, comparable uh, scenarios uh, in this young mangrove site where, where I start them off at a, at a young size uh, at time zero. And in the various simulations, the, the 40, the 80, and the 100, this is what they do. And the, the 40 and the 80 do, do okay. Uh, the 100 crashes in the very end, and it crashes in spectacular fashion. Um, this is relative elevation here. The 40 centimeter never loses any elevation. The, the 80 eventually does, and the 100, of course, does. And this is what they do. Uh, this is kind of fascinating. These are the theoretical limits of the, this is the one year class. These are the matures here. When I started off here at this elevation, they all uh, initially gain elevation. They actually gain quite a lot of elevation. The 40 centimeter simulation advances to this point, and by this point, it's essentially an equilibrium sea level. The 80s uh, first increase, and then they start to decrease in elevation, and they advance in 100 years to this point, and the 100-year simulation goes all the way to extinction. Um, so those are young mangroves. Mature mangroves look, look a bit like this. If I start them off at a mature size, they all do okay. The, 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 one, uh, the 100 centimeter, the um, the 80 and the 40. And this is how the relative 
uh, elevation changes over time. And this is what this uh, plot looks like. So there is no, they don't start off at a, at a young size. They start off at a mature size. They start off here. And initially, uh, if we look at the, the 40s, the 40 starts off here and it just advances to this point here. It increases elevation the whole time and then this is, this is the end of the simulation. The 80 starts here, goes all the way down here and then backtracks and goes back here and stops there. And the 100 starts here, goes down in this direction to some point and then all the way back to essentially the starting point. So that's how that, that, that works. And this graph of the vertical accretion versus the rate of sea level rise explains the difference between the uh, responses of the young and the mature. This curve here is the response of the mature canopy. Um, its accretion rate as, as a function of the rate of sea level rise. And this solid line is the response of the young. Oops, both, both at, um, both at 100 centimeters uh, of sea level rise. So there is, in the mature uh, plants, there is an age premium uh, initially. So they're packing on a lot of elevation here um, in the early years. The young uh, canopy, uh, there's a growth premium, and they add a lot of volume as they're growing. But then once they mature, they stop adding, that growth premium goes away, and that's what you see. So um, there's an advantage to being old uh, early, early on. And this table here summarizes some of the major differences uh, between these sites, among these sites, um, and the different simulations. So if we look at the uh, salt marshes here, for example, um, in, this is the, in the second quarter of the simulation. This is in the fourth quarter of the simulation. All, their, their accretion rates uh, are always less than uh, three millimeters a year. Um, they can't do better than that. The mangroves, on the other hand, they've got really high accretion rates. And, and th their accretion rates actually rise when the rate of sea level rises. And carbon sequestration, there's a huge difference in the uh, rates of carbon sequestration between these different um, simulations. Uh, the mangroves are always um, much better than uh, the marshes. So um, some preliminary conclusions from this is that the, the tidal mangroves consistently have higher rates of vertical accretion and greater rates of carbon sequestration than salt marshes, which leads me to say that the ecosystem service value of mangroves is greater than salt marshes. And that pain, it pains me to say that because I'm a salt marsh guy. Uh, but I, I believe it's true. I mean, we know that mangroves are better at knocking down waves than salt marshes. Well, they also sequester more carbon. They also are more resilient to sea level rise. They're just better. Um, mature mangroves are more resilient than young mangroves. Uh, they have a significant head start that endows them with greater vertical accretion rates. To successfully transgress, growth of young mangroves will need to outpace sea level rise. That's kind of an interesting thing to think about when you, when you think of this on a landscape scale. It's going to be um, inland. It's going to be young mangroves that are transgressing, but they've got to grow up faster than the rate of sea level. Uh, the limiting factor for mangrove northern migration is seed transport. You know, that's not from this modeling. That's from the um, talented people on the ground, like, like uh, uh, Candy Feller, who's been looking at this for many years. Um, it's seed transport. It's not climate warming. That's not the limiting factor. It's seed transport. We could... We could proactively accelerate migration, which would offer greater protection of our coasts from a rising sea level, greater carbon sequestration, and greater protection from 
protection from coastal storms. But there's a, there's a caveat. When mangroves drown, they do so with significant loss of elevation due to the large volume of labile organic matter and roots in their soils. When they fail, they fail catastrophically. And when you think about what that's going to look like, it means, I think, <clears throat> I think mangrove coasts are going to change episodically. They're going to they're going to hold the line until the last minute, and then boom, uh, they're going to start losing elevation at a phenomenal rate. Mar marshes, on the other hand, they're going to transgress yeah. gradually. They don't have nearly as much labile or uh, living root mass in their soils as mangroves. So I'll stop there. And I know I've gone over, so sorry about that. Thanks, Jim. Our next speaker is Margaret O'Brien from the Marine Science Institute at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Hi, let me get my screen going here. Come on, present. And it's a little twirly thing here. One second. This one. You see a title slide, I hope. Yes, I see Nas. Yes. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Okay. Hi, I'm, I'm, uh, my name is Margaret O'Brien, as Sparkle said. I'm a data curator and part of the leadership team of an NSF funded repository called the Environmental Data Initiative, um, or EDI is our, our acronym. Uh, we archive data from environmental and ecological research, and I also work with a few observatories and synthesis projects. Um, my own area of expertise is data management for location-based research groups working in ecosystem science, um, including mechanisms to structure and deliver that data for potential reuse, um, like for synthesis or data aggregators, um, agencies, um, and decision makers. So that's what I'll talk about today. So my examples are all based on environmental and ecological data, but the same principles could apply to other types of research data. So first, I'd like to give you a little bit of background about EDI, the repository, um, because repositories are my primary point of reference. Um, EDI's data holdings represent a pretty broad spectrum of both data and metadata, typically research results. We archive all the data from the long-term ecological research, or LTER network, um, although we're not limited to that, our scientific expertise is in environmental and ecological data, so we would be considered a domain repository. Uh, the network of LTER sites is shown here, and approximately a third of those are coastal, so have data that might be of interest to this group. Many of those data sets are ongoing time series, and some are now decades long. And there are both research times, we hold both research time series where the sampling strategy is tied to a specific question, and other data sets that are more like traditional monitoring. And these are the kind of data, data sets that would be valuable for, say, model validation. Uh, the most prominent feature of the data holdings we have is their heterogeneity. Uh, given that they're from site-based research, there's a high variability in the collection methods. Most of the files are on the small side with variable structure and semantics. And long-term collection means that methods may even shift over the life of the data set. And as far as formats, these are by necessity formatted to best support the original research questions. So the plot on the left is from a paper describing the degree to which these small scale data sets do not have or are not expected to have robust data management components. Now the LTER sites are pretty close to the inflection point of that plot uh, because that's funding on the left on the uh, y-axis. Um, EDI's history, we actually grew out of the data management community, which has decades of experience with this type of data. Uh, the repository was spun off in 2016 to serve researchers beyond the LTR network. And that transition was essentially seamless. And today, EDI is a recognized archive for several publishers and is part of this registry of research data repositories for uh, which is called RE3 data. And we're also recommended by NEON for research results derived from their observations. Uh, this timeline just shows a few milestones, including the development of the repository infrastructure during the LTER years 
and that we were one of the very early nodes contributing to data one. So I'll talk a little about data one because you've probably heard of this. They are an aggregator of metadata for environmental data. So they provide a one-stop shop for many repositories like EDI so that researchers or anyone actually has access and enhanced search and discovery of for earth and environmental data. Uh, their roster of membership repositories is now at about 45, I think, and it's still growing. Uh, and their number of data sets that they um, expose is over 800,000. Uh, they aggregate their, they, their aggregated metadata means that you have simpler search and, dis and delivery. And uh, the lower screenshot shows the coverage of data in Southern Florida, uh, which might be of interest, interest to a lot of you. Um, a significant contribution of that data is from the LTR site located in the Everglades, which some of you are familiar with or even involved with. So in general, a repository like EDI will offer services in addition to basic archive of research data and its delivery to, uh, whoops, to aggregators like Data One. Uh, these include DOI management for citations, uh, a programmer interface plus data management training for groups and individuals. And it's important that we keep involved with the larger community of informatics professionals, especially to collaborate on these new technologies. And I'll talk a little bit more about repository activities in a bit. So, excuse me, there are some large scale frameworks that we can use to classify research data and even the repositories themselves. Uh, the FAIR data principles have been around since about 2016. They describe data that are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, and more recently, there's a similar set of principles for repositories using the ac acronym TRUST. Um, so recent enough that they don't have a, a good graphic yet. Um, but both of these um, frameworks are intended to drive policy rather than being specific guidelines for how to actually handle data. Uh, for that, though, we have a more general framework here that applies to the data itself. And this one is called the Five Star Data. It's developed by uh, Tim Berners-Lee, who you'll recognize for his uh, involvement in the early web. So basically, any data set could be classified according to these stair steps, or one star would simply be to make your stuff available on the web in whatever format under an open license. Two stars would mean that it is now in a structured format. It's a spreadsheet instead of a table, or scan of a table. Uh, three stars would be to make it available in a non-proprietary open format. So that would be an ASCII table, like a CSV, instead of Excel. And at the higher levels, that would be four and five stars, uh, you use um, uniform identifiers or universal identifiers to denote the data components so that others can point at specific parts of a data set and even link your data to other data sets to provide context. And I've put here um, some examples of where you would place different kinds of data today. Generally, anything that's on paper, a local hard drive, or exchanged via email is not even on the spectrum. So most ad hoc databases or generalist repositories would be either one or two star um, because the, the databases are structured, of course, but I grouped them with the generalists because often they are siloed and the licensing is not always open. Um, plus there's just not a lot of room on this slide to get all that in. But what I wanna point out here is that the research data in a domain repository would be three star. Domain repositories need a significant amount of metadata similar to what would be required for a data paper. And one of the contributions of the LTR network is to formalize the process, this process for ecosystem data to identify what types of metadata are important and what formats work best. Creating level four and five data is much rarer, especially for research data. The highest, these highest stars would require expertise that's beyond the scope of a scientific researcher and many, even many data managers. And so for the most part, you might see complex data in RDF for mission, mission data with predefined uses. Um, another way to look at this uh, assessed data for particular use is these guidelines for measuring data set maturity. Um, this is an example of one used for NOAA, used by NOAA for its digital environmental and geospatial data products. Uh, there are others. Uh, this reflects the kind of framework that date that's used for data destined for a particular use like weather data. Um, so this maturity model is data set oriented as opposed to process oriented. It's quantifiable and stresses data quality and the scientific oversight 
that's critical to specific uses. There's a, a reference to it on the bottom, but since you can't read the text, I've reproduced the uh, rows in blue and the columns there. And then here, this again, this, these levels are labeled for some familiar situations. Research data, again, is mostly a two or three, so it's better off than ad hoc, but not on the level of something like a data product from an established satellite missions. That would be up in the fours. And uh, reference data tends to be the most um, highly managed. Um, keep in mind, too, that data product is not the goal of most research projects, even for LTERs. Uh, level three is recommended by NOAA, but for its data centers. So applying a system like this really helps to define what steps should be taken if data products were to become a goal. It requires features like controlled measurement vocabularies, quality control, and quality, assess, uh, quality assessment metrics. Um, so use cases are an essential um, part of a framework like this because they set the priorities, identify the tasks. Um, so the message here is that often research data are not quite up to the level you might need in order to combine them easily with other sources for things like model validation, and like what we were hearing about this morning. But this is about where we are now. We're looking at these technologies to create star four and five star data, level four and level five, and making sure that we have adequate metadata to take advantage of them. And importantly, we're trying to prioritize the data that would benefit the most from this extra attention. And those high priority data sets are likely to be the long-term observations. But there is some good news already. Um, one is that we're working at ways to prepare analysis-ready data. Um, we know that a large time investment is in the cleaning and combining of primary data sets until everything is completely understood and converted into a usable format. So to accelerate this, our group, EDI, is defining flexible domain-specific data models and converting primary data into these using a lightweight and distributed workflow. Um, so a level zero would be data that came in from the, that's close to the research, but it still is well described. And here it's in the repository. Level one then is reformatted only. We don't do any aggregation or any other processing. And we archive this in the repository as well. And because these are all formatted in the same way, now the repository can create code to read and aggregate and subsample these. Uh, a level two, then researchers can use the harmonized level one and the basic code as input and add their own specialized analyses. Uh, the advantages of using a workflow like this so that the original data description and curation practices are maintained, the workflow framework is repeatable, and an intermediate format is not determined by a, sim uh, by a single synthesis research question, and the most harmonization steps can be performed by non-specialists. Um, and it's probably obvious, but once you have data harmonized, you can plot it pretty simply. So these are some sample plots from one of our harmonized models showing um, a num the number of taxa over time across four different data sets. Uh, let's see what else, a spatio-temporal sampling effort, species accumulation curves, and species shared among sites. Um, another uh, feature that's coming along is the semantic search. And data one and some of its member nodes are leading an effort to add this, uh, this, this, these powerful search tools to assist in finding data. So these kinds of searches mean that we are finding ways to push research data into those four and five star levels. Now, I hope I have time for one more example. Yes. Um, so this is all of this kind of work in action. Um, this is uh, one of my favorite projects. Um, this is uh, the US Marine Biodiversity Observation Networks are primarily researchers who develop brand indices for biodiversity at all levels. Um, they use this phrase, microbes to megafauna. Um, but the projects have diverse funding and are administered by NOAA, usually by partnering with the regional associations or the OOSs. So the MBONs are working with the National Marine Sanctuaries to use MBON time series data to inform the sanctuary's periodic condition reports. Uh, these are generated every five years. Historically, the sanctuaries create condition reports by assembling teams of experts from local research communities, but they would like to augment this with regular ongoing research grade time series rather than assembling data sets uh, every time. So the data system to fit this repeatable use requires reliable structured data, uh, and this data flow diagram in the lower right is the standard for the MBONs, but it also needs well-described use cases, exactly what ind the indices should be and how they are displayed 
which is what the sanctuaries provide. And so we're still working on the last steps of this pipeline where no matter the repository that the data can be delivered in consistent familiar mechanisms. And uh, we're looking at ERDAP for this. There are other examples of this type of um, relationship between data providers and indices, um, but I won't go into those here. Um, so the takeaway messages, basically there is a lot of research data, but it's not always easy to find and use. Uh, any future use of these depends on high quality metadata at the source. Uh, the features that push the research data into the realm of linked data, making it available for multiple unknown uses, so this would be any interoperation or reusability, these require technical solutions and informatics professionals. But research data like time series could be more easily incorporated into systems like predictive models, um, so this might be considered targeted IR for um, interoperable and reuse and used more formally like mission data. But for this, we need well-described use cases to prioritize data sets and define the details and then ways to put this into proposals. And that's all I have. Um, I think I ended on time, we're not too far off. Um, so thank you, my contact information is there plus some of the information about the repository. Thank you, Margaret. Our next speaker is going to be John Loftus from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Okay, so it looks like we can see your presentation. But I can't hear you. My audio now? Perfect. Sorry, I forgot my computer's also got a separate key I have to press to enable audio, <laughs> in addition to the digital audio. The title of my presentation is called Validating Operational Flood Forecast Hydrodynamic Models at the Street Level Using Sensors and Citizen Science. And I'm a research assistant professor at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, the College of William and Mary. And what you're seeing here in the background is basically the city of Norfolk, about three miles south of the Norfolk Naval Base at a couple of intersections that frequently flood on Hampton Boulevard. Um, now, of course, the challenge with urban flooding that we commonly face when we're talking about hydrodynamic models is that you know we need a creative way for our models to be validated. Otherwise, we don't know if they're accurate. Um, so on that side of things, there's a variety of different types of urban and rural flood models, both in the coastal and uh, inland plains that you can use. Um, but in this particular case, we're mostly focusing on hydrodynamic models that are forced with tidal boundary conditions and uh, atmospheric uh, wind and pressure forecasts, along with rainfall forecasts to provide us that combined flooding. Um, so a lot of our data that we're using are also trying to validate rainfall-induced flooding. Now, on the front of trying to validate a model, um, in many cases, the standard approach is to use water level sensors. Um, but what I'm talking about today is not just using a uh, sensor network that we've developed in Hampton Roads, Virginia called StormSense uh, that I help manage, but also uh, one of the other things that we've been using most frequently is a citizen science project called Catch the King that I helped to develop with uh, some of our local media partners back in 2017. Um, and this involved volunteers, teachers, and uh, what we called tide captains that kind of deputized themselves to teach other people in their communities and neighborhoods essentially how to use a mobile application that's free on iOS and Android platforms called Sea Level Rise to help us validate our hydrodynamic models at a much higher resolution than was previously available. Um, the approach that we use is, of course, not as effective necessarily as the U.S. Geological Survey's open file reports that they'll publish after major hurricanes or storm events uh, that will cause activation for those particular types of efforts. Um, I found them useful when I published my dissertation focused on flooding and Hurricane Sandy um, that uh, McCallum and his partners published back in 2013. And we've been using all of those types of reports since then and thought, well, hey, what if we could get volunteers to collect these types of data using their smartphone and the embedded GPS on their mobile devices? In this particular case, it's important. So this paper published by some of our friends and colleagues at Old Dominion University, Tall Ezer and Larry Atkinson in 2015, have shown that a lot of our streets and areas that are public spaces that people can access are frequently inundated. And they're projected to get much worse depending on whether or not you're using the long-term uh, trend records from NOAA's Sewell's Points Gauge there in Norfolk 
uh, near the naval base, or the uh, much higher projection shown at the top right is from the IPCC's uh, medium level projection. The challenge with sea level rise when you're combining this with storm surges, you can kind of see these two lines that are hovering up above um, our mean trend at Sewell's Point there in Norfolk are based on hurricanes and basically just shows what the storm tide of those events would be compounded with the future highest astronomical tides that are expected in these particular years based on monthly mean sea levels estimated using NOAA's long-term projections and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers projections. So there's many individual things that uh, municipal planners can use to try and make these decisions. In our case, we're mostly focused on the near term, the 36 hours into the future using our hydrodynamic models, and then trying to map where the inundation would be based on those information at extremely high resolutions. Uh, you may have read about some of the work that we've done at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science with Catch the King, our citizen science project, and Esri's blog, and also on Science Friday. Uh, about this time last year, we spoke on Ira Flato's show with the, uh, had the privilege to talk about uh, a lot of the data that we collected with the citizen science project and the successes that we had with those data. Um, we've been doing this since 2017. It's a massive citizen science effort. Uh, each year, it's a little bit different depending on how nice the weather is, since you know how volunteer efforts usually work. If it's really nasty and rainy outside, like it was last year in 2019, um, basically, our focus is we pick the highest astronomical tide and we kind of use it as an in situ um, tidal calibration for our model. Um, in this particular case, we have people go out during what we predict to be the highest astronomical tide of the year. And then if we happen to get extra wind, rain or something else on top of that, that just gives us more for our model to validate. Um, when it's blue sky flooding days, like true tidal flooding, uh, we get the most volunteers, mostly because it's a gorgeous day outside, but there's water all over the place for them to actually map. Last year on sub Sunday, October 27th, we had 291 people show up. And the previous day, uh, we also had people uh, collect data the night before when we had a high wind event uh, directly before our annual flooding um, activation. In this case, what we usually do is we'll build some form of uh, like Esri story map uh, that's usually sponsored by several of our individual media partners that basically show this kind of time-lapse video of what this looks like for the entire Hampton Roads region, which consists of 18 cities and counties in the greater Hampton Roads region. We lead these training events. People will walk around and basically collect data along the edge of the water, and then we use it to mal validate our street-level flood forecast models. This is an example of what we posted last year where people can click on parks that are near them, find public spaces, click on the URLs, and it will give them Google Maps directions where to the, they can go to find that place. Um, the real benefit behind this really is that uh, we get additional data to validate our models, but we can also use it for hydro correction. Um, so this is kind of a map showing uh, in collaboration with a lot of our media partner efforts using uh, local prints and digital media. Uh, we even have TV stations, our local ABC and NBC affiliates also uh, given us airtime during prime time to allow us to engage a lot of citizen science volunteers. And in our initial year, 2017, uh, we actually garnered the Guinness World Record, collecting the most high water marks in the shortest period of time at the world's largest environmental survey, collecting nearly 60,000 GPS data points in less than six hours. Now, the benefit behind this really is, of course, we had a lot of effective engagement efforts. I only helped spearhead parts of these. Our partners at WHRO, our local uh, NPR affiliate, uh, directly engaged a lot of our public schools. We got 116 elementary, middle school, and high schools integrated with their standards of learning, or SOLs, in uh, fields that were related to tides and flooding, like physics, trigonometry, chemistry, and forms of water quality, uh, when we talk about environmental science. And so as those individual groups were involved, we also got students that were involved at relatively young ages to uh, engage themselves in uh, student-led projects where they had small budgets, where they were able to go out and install like these gauge steps like this individual Olivia Basco did in 2019 from Hampton Roads Academy. Um, and of course, these types of things on citizen science, like that's an example of my profile picture on Facebook, uh, having interactive things like that, strangely enough, garnered a massive amount of attention because people were like, seeing those things online, and it drew them to where they can find our flood forecasts and how they could get involved in this citizen science project. Um, in this case, the flood forecasts that are available on the uh, website that we maintain for Virginia called adaptva.org, 
shows 36 hour forecast for a model called Tidewatch. This gives you basically storm tide predictions at certain locations where we have water level sensors that we can use to validate those data. And these include sensors like this example here from Newport News, sensor number three. This is within the Storm Sense Network, which is an IoT sensor network that I've helped establish with a lot of our municipal partners. And it also integrates data from several other sensor networks. For example, uh, the top left-hand corner, this is the uh, NOAA gauge at the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel um, and the NOAA gauge at the York River Coast Guard Training Facility. Um, and in each of these cases, we run model simulations and then compare the root mean squared error between what seem to be almost two identical lines, mostly because uh, we've got a magenta and a bright red line that kind of almost entirely overlap, except for some examples where you can see some high winds during our king tide last year. Um, but we also incorporate data from the U.S. Geological Survey's uh, sensor network and, of course, our IoT sensor networks maintained by the City of Newport News and the City of Virginia Beach, shown here in the bottom right-hand corner. So integrating data from all these platforms, we provide storm tide forecasts at these places, which NOAA naturally already does this, but the U.S. Geological Survey doesn't necessarily do that because it's not part of their purview to do prediction, just observation. Um, and in this case, we also, of course, provide predictions for IoT sensors within Virginia and its coastal plain at the moment. The real benefit behind this is that we then translate this to a map uh, using LIDAR data and high resolution uh, digital elevation models that are built from those. We ingest approximately 2.4 gigabytes of data from the National Weather Service on a regular basis using their coastal NAM nest products. Um, to allow us to basically predict up to 36 hours in advance and predict both storm surge in the sense of storm tide for areas within 200 meters of the coastline. Um, and in many of these areas, we do this up to 36 hours in advance using this high resolution uh, LIDAR data products. Sometimes these are scaled to three foot or one meter resolution in some areas and other places where you have less resolution like Virginia's Eastern Shore to scale to five meter resolution. The benefit behind this is the model updates this twice daily at noon and midnight uh, based on 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. model simulations that take approximately 1.25 hours to run the SCISM hydrodynamic model. It's an open source model using 72 CPUs. And it basically gives us hourly outputs, so 36 individual outputs from the time the model starts to literally forecast tomorrow's flooding today using an embedded GPS and GIS mechanism that essentially allows you to view this on both mobile, tablet, and PC devices using ArcGIS Online's time-aware layers. Now, furthermore, we then use our sensor network to validate whether or not this uh, streaming output that's updated automatically uh, for our forecast product, figure out whether or not it's accurate. Uh, we've embedded Wendy uh, and their GIS uh, layers that they've embedded both in JavaScript format using JSON and uh, uh, CSV formats to use GIS. And we compare a lot of our individual sensors. So all those little dots on the left-hand side of the map are little uh, water droplets are meant to represent individual gauges. We go back and compare what did our forecast look like on the left-hand side for some of these sensors in Newport News and Virginia Beach to give some examples. And then what was the actual water level as reported by the water level sensor there? In many cases, we we're reasonably accurate. As we add new sensors, we're realizing that maybe there's some areas that our model could improve. We have compounding storm tides mixed with heavy rainfall that are not necessarily always accurately predicted, and especially in areas with very high water tables. And so we realized we've got some work to do in the city of Virginia Beach. We've got combined flow coming up from the Pamlico Sound in North Carolina, merging with storm surge coming down the rivers in Virginia Beach. And so in each of these cases, it kind of helps us elucidate specifically where there are areas where we can make improvements with our model. And in this case, we are able to run the schism hydrodynamic model from 60 degrees west uh, out in the Atlantic Ocean, including you know, Isle of Bermuda, all the way inland to cover the entire U.S. East and Gulf Coasts, along with portions of South America and Central America as well. In this case, as I described earlier, basically take atmospheric data in terms of wind and pressure fields and drive that with surge data and building elevations to give us outputs that are on the street level scale. In this example from Hurricane Matthew in 2016, you can essentially see what these time aware layers look like leveraging Web 3D right in your web browser. So as we're kind of concluding here, essentially uh, there's a water level 
sensing uh, products in terms of water level sensors. And we also have the app called Sea Level Rise. And essentially a person just uses or downloads this app on their mobile or tablet device, um, usually activated with 3G or LTE connection. And then they can go out into the field and essentially collect data. This is what the iPad interface looks like. They drop GPS breadcrumbs behind them as they walk. And the GPS of their device can then translate that information into a GIS platform where attribute tables will track where the latitude, longitude, and timestamp for each of these individual measurements. We turn those into contours and then ultimately uh, compare them with our hydrodynamic model's prediction or that same time at that same location matching the timestamp. And then statistically, also geographically compare linear distance difference between what our model predicted at the cell center points and ultimately what the actual extent of the flooding was based on what was tracked by our volunteers. In this example, our mean horizontal distance deviation was 7.16 meters. This is our models at five meter resolution here. That's a little bit more than our uh, five meter scale. So in our case, we've got a slight amount that we could potentially improve for these 120 points that are shown here. Just to give an example of how that works. We're also pretty data forward. We share this directly with our observers so they can see and click on a map and directly access not only the forecasts from our StormSense network, but they can also see our uh, tidal forecasts with the uh, maximum flood extents that are predicted for the Catch the King event that we do every year as so our tidal calibration they can zoom in and see. Before the events, the blue layers that represent what we predicted to be the maximum flood extent, and then in real time, their data points appear on the map as they collect them with time showing exactly when those events took place and exactly where those points were on the map as dropped by our volunteers. So in this particular case, it allows them to view their data publicly. Of course, we've also published papers because our water levels are not always static. In this case, we're looking at 8 to 9 a.m. on the left-hand side versus 9 to 10 a.m. in that same location on the right-hand side. And we can explore exactly what several locations in the city of Norfolk, as is shown here, some examples in the city of Virginia Beach where this mean horizontal distance deviation changes hour by hour based on each of the model's predictions of maximum flooding extents. So in conclusion, basically one of the key elements is that we were able to effectively hydrologically correct our model because in some cases um, we're using LiDAR to raw digital elevations which are usually from aerial surveys. They usually can't see under bridges over open waterways and so areas that were previously non-tidal creeks as sea levels rise, they're now becoming tidal creeks. And so as a result, they can actually track the king tide and we can go back and fix the model and rerun the simulation to see what that should look like and at least loosely incorporate where inundation should be happening. Mostly because our models are volume conservative when we talk about hydrodynamic models. So in this case, you can see some points that are far down there to the south of where the water is trapped at a culvert that it should have been able to flow through. By identifying and using this mean distance deviation function, we can see points that are hundreds of feet away from where the nearest water was predicted to be on the map and correct those spaces that are presently missing in terms of hydrologic correction on our maps. And so based on this information, it kind of just gives you an idea of where these roadways need to be split so that there's water that can flow underneath them. And in this case, buildings are also resolved within our models as well for volume displacement functions. Um, so in conclusion, basically taking this information, we built a model that was relatively accurate in 2019. We'll be running this again in 2020. We also uh, found that there's some interesting implications when you incorporate storm drainage systems. Um, for example, lots of nitrogen and phosphorus in the fall when tidal flooding happens is also when people are fertilizing the lawns to prepare for the winter. We found a massive influx of nitrogen and phosphorus species in a separate concomitant event that uh, was conducted in Norfolk called Measure the Muck, where they're actually tracking exactly what the water quality standards were in and around these areas where water was coming through storm drainage systems. And finally, again, hydro correction, including ditches and narrow creeks and areas where you've got heavily canopied tree cover. Um, these are areas that are still uh, loosely unknown in terms of how deep those creeks actually are. So we are able to hydrologically correct those to fix them. And we'll be doing Catch the King again this year with a uh, relatively remotely safe option since mostly people are collecting these data independently or maybe with a partner with safe social distancing. If it's in a minor that's doing this with the parent, um, we'll be conducting this again at the highest astronomical time on October 18th at 10 o'clock in the morning at Norfolk. But of course, that's also the highest astronomical time for most of the East Coast. So if you wish to uh, participate, there are many ways for you to participate in your own locality or state. Thank you.
Thanks, John. Um, our next presenter will be Scott Hagen from Louisiana State University, the Center of Coastal Resilience. Are you seeing Scott? Um, I can see he's trying to take over the screen okay. by myself. Good. good. I think he's good. Okay. Are you good? Yeah, yeah. yeah, Scott. I want to start my presentation with your focus on the lower part of this title slide, which is the coastal land margin of the northern Gulf of Mexico. The cooler colors are representing water depths and the warmer colors are land surface elevations. And the northern extent goes to about the 10 meter elevation land contour. We can appreciate the actual location of this with this slide. The rightmost figure has a long and horizontal red rectangle that designates this coastal land margin of Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and the Florida Panhandle. So this is the location that I'm going to focus on for today's talk. I want to recognize the many contributors, these essential contributors to the work that I have the opportunity to present, especially the PhD students. And you'll note that Many of these PhD students have now moved on to their positions as tenure track assistant professors and, and research scientists and coastal engineers. And when you take a hard look at the science collaborators highlighted in bold blue are the expertise that all of these folks have. And what that does is it, it really exemplifies the fact that we have a truly interdisciplinary group. And throughout my slides, you'll see several references. On the lower left, you'll notice one by Delorme et al., Denise Delorme. And this particular reference is bolded in black. The title is, I should say, Denise DeLorme and, and her co-authors, and particularly Sonia Stevens, put together an article that really does a great job of describing how we have achieved transdisciplinary research outcomes and how we went about it. One of those ways was through the continued sharing of a process diagram. So I emphasized to the students in particular but all of the research scientists in general, the importance of where they fall on this process diagram and how they're connected to each other and to the management com community. This was published in 2017, but we used it when we began this research in 2010. What I hope I'll achieve with my presentation is a recognition of the importance of the coastal dynamics of sea level rise, of taking into account how the coast changes as the sea level rises and how it changes under different global climate uh, carbon emission scenarios and, and how we can capture that. So I'll begin by describing the basic framework I'll show some demonstration of the capabilities, and then I'll discuss a little bit on the extension of this coastal dynamics of sea level rise to risk assessments, particularly for the evaluation of natural and nature-based features. Early on, we started out by asking ourselves, how important is it to take into account the hydrodynamics and can we differentiate between a bathtub model and a hydrodynamic model and we did this in a publication that occurred in 2012 
Peter Bacopoulos and I, and what you see here is if we just take the baseline extent of the astronomic tide in gray, and we raise that by one meter, how far inland will it extend? So a basic bathtub model, as opposed to taking into account the hydrodynamics. With this type of an approach, we're not changing anything on the coast, no landform, no dunes, no shoreline, no barrier islands, no land use, land cover. We're simply assessing the difference between a bathtub model and a hydrodynamic model. And we can do the same with hurricane storm surge. And so what we were able to do is to convince ourselves and our sponsors of the importance of this hydrodynamic approach. The next thing that we did is we said, okay, we know we have this importance of taking into the account the hydrodynamics. What about the changes that we might see? How can we begin to emphasize that? And so we've got two graphics here. Both of them are representing the nonlinearity of the surge response between 1960 and 2005 for Hurricane Katrina. Both of them, if the response was fully linear, would be white. There would be no cooler colors or no red colors. If we have a cooler color, a darker blue or a lighter blue, it's indicating that the surge response is a little bit less than what the sea level rise is that occurred over that time frame. If it's red, it's some multiple of that sea level rise. So some increase beyond just the sea level rise in the hurricane storm surge response. And so on the left is sea level rise only, and on the right is taking into account the shoreline and the population change through land use, land cover conditions and recognition of barrier island migration over that small period of time. We did the same thing with respect to the astronomic tides. And here we focused in particular on Grand Bay, Mississippi, and it, the Mississippi Sound. And what we were able to do is to demonstrate that the tidal amplitude percent change now from 1848 to 2005 has changed in a nonlinear fashion. Again, it, it gave us ammo for the approach that we wanted to develop for our future projections of climate change and sea level rise at the coastal land margin. What we also need to take into account is how the salt marsh might respond. And Jim talked about this with his marsh equilibrium model. And we've used that coupled with our tidal hydrodynamic model in order to begin to be able to describe this overall process. One point I want to make and to emphasize is the care one must take, especially in a microtidal system, on employing bare earth LIDAR. So in the upper right, the figure on in the middle of, of the page or the figure to the left in the upper right, is just bare earth LIDAR digital elevation model. On the right is the adjusted LIDAR and each of these has a transit running in the same location, and that is plotted in below, where I've emphasized that LIDAR is not a panacea. I say that because if you look at the transit from the bare earth LIDAR through this marsh system, you'll see that the elevations, the, the marsh table as represented by the bare earth LIDAR is above mean high water. If that is generally the case through a large marsh system like this, then the marsh simply wouldn't be able to survive when in fact the marsh table has to lie somewhere in between mean high water and mean low water. I also want to emphasize that this is 
particularly true in a microtidal system and it, it while it is less important in a mesoscale tidal system mesotidal system it's still important if what you're interested in doing is migrating from one species to another species where just changes in centimeters can flip from one vegetative type to another. All of our marsh evolution modeling work is done with a model developed by Kareem Alazad as a part of his PhD dissertation. It's the HydroMem or the Hydrodynamic Marsh Equilibrium Model. I don't have time today to go into the details on it, I have provided some references and there's ample opportunity for you to read up on it in particular, but the bottom line is it's coupling an astronomic tide model, a high resolution hydrodynamic model that describes the major tidal creeks through the marsh system with the marsh equilibrium model. And there have been some really neat advances in, in how we apply that just in the last couple of years. So when we put this all together, what we can do is we can actually describe the coastal dynamics of that coastal land margin. Here we're looking at an animation. If you look at the upper left-hand corner of this animation, you'll see present, low, intermediate low, intermediate high, and high and how this landform has changed relative to the sea level rise that we're projecting. If we have a higher sea level rise, we're going to have more creation of open water in those marsh spaces, and, and that's represented by the Manning's End. If we have a higher sea level rise, we'll have more loss of the dunes, more loss of barrier islands, and that's represented in the approach that we take. Such an approach then allows us to put this together and assess under different scenarios of sea level rise, whether it is our present condition, a low, an intermediate low, an intermediate high, or a high, the tr the, a true, truer representation of the system response so that we can project the relative difference in, for example, the 1% probability still water extents or the 100 year floodplain. We've done the same for the 0.2% or the 500 year floodplain. And then we are able to, sh to get a better appreciation with this coastal dynamics of sea level rise approach of how that floodplain is going to respond to climate change and different carbon emission scenarios and ultimately the different sea level rises. When we put this together with consequence modeling, what we can do is assess how the flood risk is going to transition at the coastal land margin. And this is uh, work that we actually have under review. It's, it's uh, been published by Research Square as a part of Nature Communications, so I do make it available to you. But it is under review, and, and as we all know, it's possible that it'll get rejected before it's all done. But trust me, we'll get this published. It's, it's uh, pretty interesting work, and, and it's part of Deanna Del, Ange Del Angel's uh, PhD dissertation. Work that we've done with uh, David Yaskowitz and led by Matt Bilski because it's relying on all of the work that he did for his dissertation. The left column, A, B, and C, is the number of displaced people. The right column, D, E, and F, is the population that's needing shelter. And this is effectively demonstrating when the 1% annual exceedance probability will exceed the present day 0.2% chance probability. In other words, under what sea level rise scenario will the 500 year return period 
response that we see today become the 100 year return period response we see in the future. We've translated this work also to the coastal Louisiana landscape. And this is part of uh, Chris Seibert's dissertation and a part of our National Science Foundation Coastal Seas Project. I've highlighted the last reference here by Chris Seibert, the quantifying historic storm surge and risk reduction in Lafitte, Louisiana, in particular because that shows how the consequent or what is the consequence of future sea level rise to a particular location. But again, like we did throughout Mississippi, Alabama, and the Florida Panhandle, we wanted to go back first. We wanted to see if we could represent the system circa 1850 and then move it forward 40 years to 1890 see very little change, move it forward again another 40 years to 1930, and we begin to see a very dramatic change. And I go back to 1890 and then forward again to 1830. And what you may notice in the central part of the image is that we've lost a lot of these, as represented by yellow, coastal forests. And we've also had a lot of channelization when the intracoastal waterway was fully connected throughout Louisiana. And by 1970, we're starting to see major land loss. By 1990, we see even more. And by 2010. So when we build a model like this that is able to describe the coastal dynamics of the sea level rise, be it historically or for our future projections, we can get a better idea of how the system is going to respond relative to future projections of lower sea level rises or higher sea level rises. My concluding remarks, Something that I've, I've almost always shared is just paraphrasing a climate change axiom. Sea levels are rising. The best we can do now is to manage the unavoidable and avoid the unmanageable. We've all read the USGS publication, Stationarity is Dead. But what I hope we can also appreciate is, is that linearity is dead. That is a bathtub type approach to sea level rise at the coastal land margin is insufficient because the response is highly nonlinear. We can't get there from here. Can't get there from here because if we don't understand the historical evolution of our coasts, we won't be able to project how it's going to respond into the future. And finally, we all have at our fingertips, regardless of what your model of choice is, whether you're an AdCERC model or an FVCOM model or a ROMS model or what have you, we've got awesome technology these days. We have supercomputers that allow us to do simulations, but all of that told, what we have though is really still only advanced diagnostic tools. And we need to use these tools in accordance with that understanding. That said, I believe what we've seen in the Mississippi River Delta plain is just a canary in the coal mine with respect to relative sea level rise of what we're going to see throughout the world in low gradient coastal land margin regions the impacts of relative sea level rise will not come smoothly. So we need to build tools that can respond to sea level rise and its acceleration and its starts and stops, just as what we see in the geological record. Finally, I wanna acknowledge NOAA and the National Science Foundation 
and some of our partners at LSU, as well as all of the high performance computing resources that we have at our fingertips. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Our next presenter is Patrick Bernard um, from the USGS. Okay, thank you. Can you see my screen okay and hear me okay? Yes, we can, Patrick. All right, great. Thanks so much. This would be a great follow-up to Scott's work as we're trying to We've been spending a lot of time building these kinds of regional models and now thinking about how we can build this kind of work out at the national scale uh, for assessing future coastal hazards due to sea level rise and storms. So a number of people have been involved in this work um, throughout the years, just a smatter of them are listed here. Um, but it's part of a very, very large effort um, within USGS and beyond. So we have a very, a very large climate problem. I think we're all on the same page here. Um, we're gonna see uh, on the order of about a billion people um, living in the coastal zone by mid-century. And by the end of this century, on the order of about one fifth of those people um, could be displaced by sea level rise. Um, but you know, a decade ago or so, when a lot of us got this work going, hazard assessments were often limited to just sea level rise alone, bathtub models that did not include the dynamic response of the coast um, in terms of morphology or um, water levels during waves, um, due to waves and storms. Uh, not to mention what's becoming a sort of a growing um, area in terms of research that is groundwater impacts. So this is kind of what the typical models used to look like. We had these passive um, models with hydrologic connectivity. So these are bathtub models, usually included just sea level rise and tides. And they are a really nice first order screening tool approach for looking at the everyday impacts of sea level rise. And here's just an example of some water levels along the west coast um, we might expect over the next century in terms of the daily tidal variability and also sea level rise. But these models are gonna under predict flooding hazards because they do not include this dynamic response to the coast. They do not include dynamic water levels. And here's just an example from Foster City, which is effectively sort of the ground zero for sea level rise and storm impacts on the West Coast. It's sort of our the San Francisco Bay version of New Orleans or Norfolk. And so here is looking at potential flooding um, just to, due to very near term sea level rise. And we show the areas in green are not are below the flood surface, but not connected um, to the ocean. But then if you include a, a large storm, this is the situation in Foster City where almost 90% of the population could be exposed to flooding just with very little sea level rise in extreme storm. So we wanted to include all these different dynamic effects uh, during an event, um, not you know, sort of the background um, seasonal effects that may occur over order of months, then the short-term effects of storm surge, river discharge, and for the west coast in particular, and the outer coast, wave setup and run-up are particularly important. And these are just some numbers from uh, from California. The, the different contributions will vary significantly across the United States, but the point being that these can all add up significantly are a huge component of the, of the future flood risk. And so we developed the coastal storm modeling system to address this dynamic response to the coast and these dynamic water levels, bring in all the physics, use future forcing from global climate models so the future iteration of the climate, include all these relevant factors such as wind waves, atmospheric pressure, shoreline change, and then include a full range of sea level rise and storm scenarios to match any planning horizon. This has been built out across California for the last decade or so. We're currently building this out in the Pacific Northwest and uh, newer versions, more integrated versions across our program in the Southeast United States and in coral reef environments as well. I'll talk about that a little bit later. So this was uh, designed to predict hazards across this full range of plausible sea level rise scenarios over the next century and beyond and the full range of storm scenarios and was really critical to the the recent success of this work is that we've been developing our tools on the front on the front end uh, the middle and the back end of all our projects with federal state city governments 
to meet their plan and adaptation needs. So the scientific outreach has been a major component of our work. And I'd argue is just as important as the science itself um, and how we, how we shape what we do and how uh, the products line up with, uh, with planning needs, with policy needs on the back end. So we've done a lot of improvements over the years with Cosmos. Um, among them is to identify and select multiple storm scenarios so we can do deterministic modeling of local extreme events, not just picking regional, regional scenarios that may not be relevant at the hyper-local scale. We spent a lot of effort incorporating morph morphodynamic response um, into our system in terms of building a new model for long-term cliff retreat, models for long-term shoreline change, um, building in compound flooding uh, more explicitly into the modeling framework um, so we can include that dual impact of uh, fluvial and ocean-based flooding events. Uh, a lot of dynamical downscaling and statistical downscaling of GCMs, in particular winds, so they're relevant within sort of orographically restricted areas like San Francisco Bay or Puget Sound, where more regional um, wind products are not gonna do the job. And then a lot of work, particularly recently, of assessing the uncertainty in particular vertical land motion. In fact, now we're working a lot with the INSAR folks, Manu Scherze among them, um, to build in vertical land motion directly into the digital elevation model. So we're, we're incorporating projections of how the land will not only change in terms of the dynamic response of the coast um, to physical processes, but also the vertical motion of the coast due to larger scale tectonic um, and like GIA type of factors. And so all this work is, was summarized in a paper last year in scientific reports that kind of pulls together a number of publications that we've put together the last decade or so. Um, so this is a good place to kind of get a nice synopsis of everything we've been up to in recent years. So this is just an overview of what the Cosmos model framework looks like. Um, we start from the global scale and then we wind our way down to the local scale, um, downscale the latest global climate models to get wind and pressure fields, um, pulling this into global wave models and then dynamically downscaling this to the regional scale. We bring in tides, um, regionally driven water levels like storm surge um, and, our, and other regional forcing. Um, and then we have a coupling here between hydrodynamics and the waves. And this ultimately gets downscaled to the local level to get the high resolution um, uh, physics of, the, of wave transformation across the surf zone and overland flow um, across the, the landscape. Um, and this also includes the storm related response of the beach itself and the dune system using X beach, which includes wave groups and then in the background, which is running, is models of long-term cliff recession and shoreline change, which are integrated into future DEMs, um, which these storm scenarios are then applied to. All this ultimately gets projected into a high-resolution digital elevation model at two-meter resolution, and that's where the products start to come into play that we get that get pushed out um, to the public. And so we spent a lot of time, like I mentioned, um, in our scientific outreach and developing our product line. And what came out of that was the Our Coast, Our Future tool. This is a Google Earth interface, which serves up, you know, hundreds of gigabytes of data on the fly across all these different scenarios, which are listed here, all these different sea level rise scenarios, all the different storm scenarios. And so people typically zoom in on their area of interest to place like Santa Barbara shown here, and start clicking through scenarios to identify the tipping points of where their risk begins to increase. And here, just click through these, going from low sea level rise to high sea level rise and incorporating storms more and more as we click through and can clearly identify areas where the risk portfolio changes dramatically. And that's how um, dozens of agencies across California are using this effort to to build right into their emergency response planning or the short term, but also for their long term climate adaptation planning. We also have a uncertainty layer here to look at the 95% confidence interval that incorporates our what, what we don't know and the, the range of possible uncertainty related to the DEM in terms 
of the ability of the model to predict water levels and also the vertical land motion. So we wanted to be really explicit about um, the potential range, not just the bullseye of what the model is. And there's also some other products in here, such as the, the duration of flooding during an event, and which makes a big difference in terms of adaptation planning, if it's just a few minutes of getting wet or if it's 24 hours, for example. Um, and also more relevant for navigation, harbor safety, our tools like looking at the maximum um, wave heights during an event, such as shown here in LA Harbor, or the maximum tidal currents, which can be um, related to scour potential and undermining of structures during an event shown here. So in addition to that, you know, as I mentioned, some of the background work we've been doing to try to, to make this uh, a more robust model is looking at the response of the coast itself. And so Sean Batusik led an effort to, to provide um, the Cosmos Coast model, which is a data assimilation approach, which takes um, all the free parameters of a model and assimilates them based on observations in the past and then uses them to make a better forward projection. And not to get into too much detail here, but basically is, is a profile model, um, which is um, set up every 100 meters along the entire California coast. And then every 100 meters where we have LIDAR data, we're pulling a historical shoreline. And then we're using that shoreline to auto-tune the parameters. And so then we have a, a tuned model of the shoreline response every 100 meters along the coast. Um, and so it's like locally calibrated, and then we're able to apply this at the regional scale. We're currently um, using satellite data now to tune these models so we can get a lot more shorelines and, and we can apply this in data poor areas anywhere in the continental United States or beyond and apply this at the national scale. And so from this, then we get these projections of where the shoreline is likely to be in the future, and then that ultimately gets integrated back into our coastal flood models. Um, similarly, looking at cliff retreat, um, a little bit of a different approach, but also something we're going to incorporate more in our shoreline work is using a suite of models in an ensemble projection, where in this case, we're um, using a Monte Carlo approach to vary the three parameters of the model and ultimately end up with a median projection and a 95% confidence interval. And then we can use this sort of in a, in a, in a, in a this projection mode to look a little bit more explicitly. Um, at the at the probability of these projections and meeting in that and also the most likely range and then project this this is just the meeting here on to the landscape to look at where these cliff edges are likely to be in the future due to sea level rise and ultimately um, integrate this back into the coastal flooding. Well, through all of our outreach work, one area we realized that we were missing on the physics side um, and the physical side is groundwater impacts. Um, in a place like Miami is ground zero for this, where you can see a, a very short-term rise in sea level due to just even the tides, which can cause significant interference in daily activities. But we wanted to look at this long-term impact of the groundwater table due to sea level rise and how it will respond in the future. You know, the basic concept is that as, as sea level rises, the water table is gonna rise at some rate um, potentially linear in some cases where the or the water um, or the aquifer system is directly um, connected to the ocean as in a place um, like Miami or in a more of a nonlinear fashion um, where the connection isn't as strong. But nevertheless, we want to identify where these hazards may exist in the future and do this in a process-based fashion using um, mod flow. And so we've now released this across all of California as a pilot to move this to the national scale. And just to show a quick example here on the left is the potential impacts of a storm um, due to overland flooding by the end of the century. But as we see on the right hand side, the water table is already today quite shallow and the potential hazard in this neighborhood in Pacifica. And during the same time frame, without a storm, we're already projecting to have groundwater inundation in this region. And so this, when we incorporate groundwater hazards, some of these communities may have a shorter term um, hazard they need to grapple with um, in addition to the more extreme um, event um, shown on the left-hand side. And as you kind of go through the different sea level rise scenarios, you can see that this risk will only increase 
And so the daily impacts of sea level rise may be manifested more in the groundwater response than in the more extreme storm response in some locations. And this work is summarized in a paper that just came out a few weeks ago, Nature Climate Change, which was led um, by our colleague, Kevin Beefus at University of Arkansas. So um, now, how does this all translate to policy? And we've done a lot of work on this and built a new tool called the Hazard Exposure Reporting Analytics Tool, which incorporates socioeconomic um, data into the physical exposure of flooding. And this really kind of helped put a lot of this work on the map in California because we're not just showing folks this sort of 2D, in some cases, um, hard to, to digest um, flood map. We can now show a map like this across California and talk to people in the governor's office and say, well, you know, this actually, this equates to half over half a million residents, $150 billion in property and all these other critical bits of critical infrastructure that are in harm's way. And that really kind of puts it more in the crosshairs of something that they have to take action on. Um, and then another what means we've been trying to communicate the science in a more effective way is to bring in um, sort of cutting edge technology such as augmented reality and virtual reality to present the information. Here's just an, an example of some augmented reality work that we did in San, Santa Monica, um, around the Santa Monica Pier. Um, where we show people through um, a telescope on the pier um, what the, the beach looks like currently, um, what it might look like in the future due to sea level rise, and what it might look like in the future with a storm on top of it um, to give them a sense or to really try to immerse them in the data and then also offer a potential solution to see how this kind of impact could be managed and mitigated. Um, similarly, we've, we've turned to virtual reality um, and working with folks um, like at Pixar and other special effects groups like Invisible Thread and Thundercloud to bring in virtual reality in a fully immersive environment um, to basically project our um, LIDAR data, our drone data, our coastal flood projections in a real world sense into a virtual reality. Um, environment where people can really be fully immersed in the, in the information and it really makes it more local and real to them. Um, exploring that as well. So this work in California, which is now being built out through the Coastal Change Hazards Program within USGS, um, is now being um, pushed out to the southeast using disaster relief funding. So all these kinds of things that you've seen here are going to be brought to this region, stretching from basically southern Chesapeake down to Miami but integrating our work across our program, um, our other centers in St. Pete and Woods Hole, Massachusetts to, you know, put out seamless topobathy DEMs, um, full suite of sea level rise and storm projections for looking at flooding extent, depth, and uncertainty, um, the long-term evolution of the coast, groundwater hazards, and socioeconomic exposure. So many of the things I've already shown you here and this is work with, uh, among others, Lee Erickson, Erica Lentz, and Davina Passeri, the latter two in our other offices. And this is going to be coming out in about a year and a half or so. This is part of a national effort within USGS to build up these kinds of, of products um, all over. Kurt Sterlazzi is leading work underway now in um, coral reef line coasts. Uh, Lee Erickson in Alaska. Um, and then myself here, California, wrapping up now in the southeast. And then looking to build out this work in these other parts of the United States as well um, with completion in about the next five years or so. So just to finish with some future directions and research gaps um, here, um, which I've touched on a lot of these, but one of the key needs really is to have consistent national application of coastal hazard models and scenarios with coordination across federal agencies, so not even necessarily the same models. And in fact, in places like the Gulf, we'd like to leverage the, the excellent work that folks like Scott have done. So maybe different uh, models under the hood, but have a consistent set of sea level rise and storm scenarios at the national scale. So working with uh, Army Corps, FEMA, NOAA, and others um, to try to see this um, to fruition as well as many academics. Um, there's a huge opportunity to do a lot more mining of satellite observations. This is an exploding field now. This could be used for shoreline change models. This could be used for validating flood models. Um, lots of capabilities there. Now we're getting satellites in the sky that can see 
every meter of the U.S. coast at daily at the at daily um, temporal scale. Um, trying to directly integrate vertical land motion into flooding projections. I talked about this already. Um, now we're using um, the state of the latest CMIP six GCM forcing, which now is getting to a fine enough scale to at least partially resolve um, atmospheric rivers and tropical cyclones, which will be particularly important as we move this kind of work into the southeast and Gulf Coast over the coming years. Um, CMIP five uh, model simply couldn't do that, so we have to turn to different techniques to get at that. What's been talked about a lot today, which is crucial, is the translation of these physical hazards into ecological and socioeconomic impacts, including the non-direct um, impacts, um, such as you know, the teleconnections, um, which were talked about earlier, these cascading effects. So I'll end it there. Um, and some more information, you can um, contact me, and we have all these other websites to get more data and information. So thank you very much. Okay, our final speaker is Robert Limper um, from RAND. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can okay, hear great. you. We don't see your screen yet. Okay. Um, well, you were going to put up my slides, right? Oh, um, I think I mean, I can put up your slides. Let's see. Maria, can you hear me? Can you uh, start uh, Dr. Lampert's slides? Yeah, I'm I'm sharing it right now. Okay, thank okay. you. You may have to move the slide. Okay, great. Okay, great. Good. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, um, so my talk's going to be a little bit different than, than the others. I, I've been enjoying um, about this model to work to the um, uh, There are many thousands of, of, of climate decision support tools out there at this point. Um, a lot of work on which ones are useful, which ones are, are, are oh, sorry, necessary. Sorry, Robert, could you yes. uh, sit closer to the speaker or your microphone? Um, breaking up a little bit. Um, I have a headset. And, um, is this a little bit better? Yes, that's better. Okay, great. I'll do this one. Great. Um, so there are, um, my talk's going to be a little different than the others I've seen. Um, there are many, um, many decision support tools out there. Some are very useful, some also. And what I want to do is just to go through a little bit of the understanding of what makes tools um, useful to decision making for the decision support and what less uh, uh, slides are. Oh, Robert, it looks like people are still having trouble hearing you. You're coming in and out. All right. Um, sorry. Um, The uh, speakers, the microphone is right in front of me. Um, uh, my voice is uh, my mouth. I'm wondering whether it's not. Uh, yeah, Rob, it's the mic. It might be the mic. Can you use a computer mic or something? That's what we're trying to do. Let me, let me just try try this. Um, now we are, we, are, we are hearing you okay now, I think. Okay, so for some reason the headset's not working. All right, let me just yeah. try it like this. Okay, is this better? Yes, much better. Um, is this better? Yes. Okay, great. All right, we'll do it this way. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, there are many, many um, decision support tools, climate uh, support tools um, out there these days. Um, what I want to just talk to you a little bit uh, about is what makes for a good tool, uh, one that's really useful, and what is uh, what what less so. 
Um, and this is basically a summary of a lot of a lot of literature and a lot of studies looking at you know what makes for 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 good tools. And I've been you know really pleased and excited to see that as, as I've listened to talks, I mean a lot of these um, lessons learned are embedded in them. And just so this is uh, a little exercise and sort of making them explicit. So um, next slide, please. So um, decision support tools, which is the uh, the broad class of um, a tool that, that we've been discussing today are aimed to help people, organizations make better decisions. Um, so wide range of decision, uh, often computer-based tools designed um, you know, to help provide people information and counter biases in human decision making. This is the, you know, the famous book by Daniel Kahneman, Think Fast, Think Slow, which, which describes uh, a lot of research, a lot of uh, psychology and social science research, which which makes clear that providing people the right sorts of tools may helps people make much better decisions by helping them focus on the information they really need to have. So next, next slide. Um, so sometimes it's really straightforward to to know what information people need and when whether a tool is helping people make better decisions. So. This is, you know, one of the picture, one of the many wayfinding apps that that we all use these days, or at least in the days when we used to go places. Um, and, um, you know, this one, um, uh, you know, helps you figure out where you are, how to decide where you, how to get where you want to go, and the Faust is wrapped to your destination. So next slide. And in for such situations, it's really easy to figure out, um, you know, criteria for deciding whether the decision that you're informing is better. So for a map app, you know, criteria is easy. Did you get to your appointment on time? But for the more, much more complicated decisions that we're talking about in this area of coastal management, um, it's a lot less obvious what it means to make a good decision. So there's many attributes to consider. Um, counterfactuals are ambiguous, so I decide a group decides to do something or pay attention to one problem, um, was that better than something else that they could have done? Um, and the consequences of whether or not we made a good decision may, may take a very long time to unfold. Um, so we make a series of decisions relative to coastal management. There's a storm, there is some damage. Did we do the right thing or would we have been much better off doing something else? It may not have been, it may not be entirely obvious even after the fact. So next slide. Okay, so what's a good decision? Um, so um, for anybody who is either raised or, or uh, you know, been a teenager, you it's uh, sometimes, it, this is again not obvious, sometimes reasonable decisions can turn out badly and bad decisions can um, turn out well, um, as we you know, all experience. And so, you know, a good outcome is not necessarily a good decision. So what is a good decision? Next slide. Um, no universal criterion is this, but generally definitions of good decisions uh, are more process-based, and we've heard a lot about process today, which is great, but um, our processes where people are explicit about goals, what are they trying to achieve, contemplate their decision from a lot of different use, views and advantages, um, consider a range of alternative options, so very focused on what can we do, how would it turn out, and how would that look from a variety of different vantages, different equity standpoints, different economic standpoints, and so forth. Um, use the best available science to understand the consequences of our actions, which is much of what we've been discussing today. Consider trade-offs, so an explicit ability to highlight trade-offs between different objectives and how different ac actions can affect those. And then follow agreed upon rules and norms and enhance legitimacy of the process and its outcomes. So this has to do with things like transparency, um, engaging with decision makers and stakeholders, who's at the table and so forth. Okay, next, next slide. Okay, so this field of decision support organizes a whole bunch of literatures to help us think about these things. Um, and so the definition decision support represents organized efforts to produce, disseminate and facilitate use of data and information to improve decisions. Um, and what does it mean to improve decisions? Um, effective decision support uh, improves usefulness of the information, 
relationship between the knowledge producers and users. And we heard a lot about that in many of these talks about these ongoing relationships, which is vital and great. And you know, are the decisions better? Next slide. Okay. Um, there are really three parts to this whole area of decision support. Again, which, you know, as, as I listened to the previous talks, um, kind of picked these out that people are doing <coughs> all of this, but it's useful to, to call it out explicitly. One is the products or the tools themselves. So the data maps, projections, images, tools, and so forth, which we've seen a lot of in, in the slides presented. Um, <coughs> Also important are then the services provided, which have been a little bit more implicit in the talks we've heard, but um, essentially the often tool-enabled interactions between scientists um, and users of the information um, to help those users use the information, so the ongoing services. And then finally, the systems, which is the organizations and ongoing relationships which allow these tools to do what they're supposed to and um, evolve and improve over time and build the trust and relationships. And again, we've heard a lot about those in many of these, these discussions, which is, which is a great thing, though it's, it's good to call it out explicitly. Um, next slide. Okay, so what principles lead to good decision support? One is this idea of co-producing knowledge, the scientists bring a, a very powerful information base, but it's really in the discussions and interactions with stakeholders and decision makers that it's determined what is most useful and what information do others have that can be layered in um, that um, uh, you know makes for a powerful decision product. A real focus on decision processes um, over the products per se, uh, um, because how people use information, how it gets inserted into their thinking and their choices is often a key part of the process. I'll say a little bit more about that. And then uh, designing these tools for learning because um, um, the process of dealing coastal management, particularly um, under climate change and all the socioeconomic changes going on at our coasts um, uh, has to be a learning process. We will. Uh, you know, adapt and learn as we go along. Next slide. Um, one very important learning process, which has been, uh, is, is a mainstay of much of the, 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 the best work in this area. It, it goes under this heading deliberation with analysis, where stakeholders deliberate over prime problem framing, you know, what it is that they care about, what are their options, um, what are the boundaries of the problem they're dealing with? Um, you know, we saw a lot, not just sea level rise, but storm surge, um, saltwater intrusion, and so forth. Um, uh, assisted by, by analysts who produce decision-relevant information products. Then, based on those problem framings, the analysts can um, find new information, adjust the information they give, and then you go in an iterative process. Um, the 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 work Rand has done with the Louisiana master plans have all been designed around this and, and around the country we've been doing um, um, uh, this sort of process where you integrate the model development in with these deliberation policy deliberations and the tools and um, um, and and um, and some in South Florida um, builds a set of tools that are very thin focused on the decisions being made. Um, one more click. You click the slide. Yeah, uh, the event. Okay, yeah. And then this is the most appropriate when, when there are many views at stake and that you expect actually people's views to um, uh, priorities um, to, res to evolve in response to interactions with each other and with the analytic problems. Okay, and then next slide. Okay, so let me just basically pull this all together in a checklist of, for effective decision support so one can see how, one, how tools um, start to, uh, uh, you know, what parts of these processes they support. So here's just a, a little circle uh, adapted so for some, from some recent work down here. Um, but you see there's a 
emphasis on to what extent do, do the tools help people define their goals, what's at stake, what their goals are, to what extent do they help them think about alternatives, things that they can do, to what extent do they allow them to find the information that's relevant to connecting alternatives to goals, um, how much does it allow them to um, articulate values and evaluate alternatives? Often people really understand better what their values are vis-a-vis -vis these sorts of problems as they um, look at the different alternatives um, to respond and to what extent do they help monitor outcomes. And then the tools themselves need to be connected to a clear decision process or have a clear understanding of the decision process there. Um, connected to and a trust, trusted and ongoing relationship. So thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, and so it's time to move into the final session. Yeah, I think uh, I want to thank all the speakers after lunch as well. Anything. Um, there's a lot of great information in there, but Sparkle and I will moderate this session. Uh, th this is the sort of the final session where we want to discuss what we heard and you know this whole theme of our workshop or conference is the interoperability of models and, and observation systems. And you know we have the premise that you know we cannot look at just biophysical system. We really need to look at the convergent or integrated system, but you know especially in terms of models and data. So we want to open up this uh, this discussion, and I'm hoping uh, both the speakers and the audience will participate. We're a little behind time, but we'll still try to finish on time. Um, so the, the question is, you know, when we take, uh, for example, biophysical systems, we heard a lot about the complex to some simple models, but I think even within their models, there is some interoperability questions and data gaps. And more importantly, when we go into connecting the biophysical model to, for example, social behavioral model, I think there's a lot to be desired there. Um, in terms of thinking about an integrated assessment of a coastline in general for hazards, uh, climate change or sea level rise. So I would like the speakers to maybe uh, maybe turn on their cameras and, and, and see if any of the speakers want to go first. Um, and, and Robert, you're welcome to facilitate the meeting. You're pretty good at those types of Okay. Uh, you know, these types of meeting to facilitate. Um, you know, Sparkle, you can chime in. Uh, so the speakers uh, and the others in on the audience, you know, please be ready to speak up on what your thoughts are on the questions, or even if you have any question, you know, post that on the chat box. So Sparkle, do you have something you want to add? Um, one thing that I'm particularly interested in is really understanding what the limitations are with connecting the biophysical models to um, the social behavioral models. What is limiting the interaction between those two? We don't have, um, we have some speakers uh, still here. If anybody wants to speak up. Not yet. So I was wondering if there's anybody uh, from the first session on the bio uh, behavioral, social behavioral session still here. Uh, Jonathan is here. Uh, Jonathan, you're muted, I think. I, I can. I I can say a little bit is one issue that's uh, really come up in the context of uh, CSDMS, the um, uh, Community Surface Dynamics Modeling System, 
has been, um, and there's ongo a lot of ongoing work on this, is developing a standardized vocabulary and ontology to try to couple um, human systems models to the extant um, uh, process models for uh, geomorphology. And I'm less familiar with um, a lot of the biophysical models that are going on here, but I think that's going to be a consistent issue is just thinking if you have a um, if you have a um, social and behavioral model and you have a um, a physical biophysical process model, simply working out what are the interfaces, what's the ontology for passing data back and forth between them can be a very big challenge. Okay. And I do have a follow-up question on that, Jonathan. So you, you've done a lot of agent-based modeling. Do you feel that the biophysical model can provide the information you need to basically develop those models or are there any gaps? In that, that's a good question. I think some of the challenges are just managing the computational complexity of coupling the models, but I think the two can be coupled very well. And from my point of view, the biggest challenge really is more in assimilating um, social and behavioral data into the model to make sure that the agent-based model is up to the task of representing the human system well. Um, I'm working on a I'm working on a, a model where we're coupling a sediment transport model to look at the dynamics of how um, coastal elevation in Bangladesh will feed back with climate change under different land use scenarios. And some of the toughest things on the agent-based side of that is working out how to represent the political processes that determine community level decision making. So from my point of view, a lot of the biggest challenges are more in integrating the social and behavioral data into the model than in coupling the agent-based model to a biophysical model. Hmm. This is Sam. Um, I just want to add that um, Oftentimes, the, the issue from a practical standpoint is of scale. So biophysical, environmental data don't adhere uh, in terms of their boundaries uh, to socioeconomic, socioeconomic systems. And then vice versa, you know, we aggregate things to a zip code. What does that mean? You know, is that meaningful? A county in Texas is except for Harris County where Houston is, is a meaningless designation, but in Maryland, it has a lot more teeth. And so trying to A, uh, reconcile the fact that ecological boundaries, environmental boundaries don't adhere to administrative and jurisdictional boundaries. And then within those, that problem area, finding a, a unit of analysis to act on um, not just understand, but act on is really problematic and can be lo can be contextual based on the region or locality being studied. Great. I would um, give I may add. Add. Re regarding that, there's some very nice work that uh, Kate Nelson, who's at Kansas State University, has been doing on doing analysis of social vulnerability to flooding at a um, very fine scale by integrating census data with cadastral data to try to get it down to the individual uh, building level. And that might be useful for folks. Hmm. Great. So Rob, yeah. do, do you have any, uh, any uh, suggestions? You know, there's a lot of different levels of uncertainty. You know, when you go from biophysical models, they have improved quite a lot over the years. And Scott can chime in too. But when you go into the social behavior or even economic models, the uncertainties are probably, I don't know if I want to call them uncertainties, but uh, they could be great. So I was wondering how, when we try to have convergent system of models, how do you deal with that system, each system uncertainty in the coupling? Do you have any suggestions or ideas on that or thoughts? Uh, I think Rob, uh, you are- well, If I could add, I, I'd be willing to start. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, Rob next. Uh, go ahead, Scott then. 
Well, if we step back, the first thing that I would try to recognize is that we still lack data. No matter the wealth of data that we all have at our fingertips, when we start to look at the size of the system, it's limited. Mm -hmm. And we can use more data. And, and I'm not sure that as a society, we recognize that and we're doing a good enough job, certainly not like our forefathers did. Mm -hmm. When we think about all the data that was collected when this country was settled and as this country was, was developed, just thinking of the United States. So we, we need more data. I, I want to also say, Obi and, and your team, I think you really put together a nice workshop and, and a nice collection of speakers. And Margaret's talk is, is essential on how this data is, is going to be reposited and made, made available to everyone. And, and that's essential. And I think that one of the challenges that we have as modelers is there may be data that is out there, but we're not aware of it or we're not aware of it until it's too late. And so efforts like Jim Morris has done to bring scientists that do work on loss on ignition on core samples from around the contiguous United States and, and assemble that data set and try to understand that with respect to sea level rise and the way that marshes are, are going to respond is, is really critical and, and more work like that needs to be done. But that all said, when we think of the system of systems from a biogeophysical point of view and we take human out of human beings out of it, we can probably do a much better job because when we bring humans into the equation, all of a sudden we have something that's very different from the rest of it, and that is free will. Mm -hmm. We have human beings that do things that are really hard to predict sometimes and hard to understand, and therein we need a tremendous more amount of data mm -hmm. and work that was done by, forgive me, I, I don't remember his name from VIMS, the, the young research assistant professor on crowdsourcing and, and, John, and commun community science. I mean, that John is Lawson. really good work, I think, yeah. And, yeah. and really essential. But still, to understand how the behavioral end of it is, is going to work out, requires that we understand humankind and that's a big lift yes uh rob uh kind of can you, you let me uh, know. yeah go ahead can you, can you okay sorry sorry for the technical yeah. difficulties i think i've got them straightened out um so um uh let, let me actually just put a put a question to, to and uh, particularly some of the, the the modelers who do try to bring in the the um the, the human elements is is how do you think about um, allocating um, uh, you know computation cycles between detail versus more scenarios to sketch out the you know realm of the plausible on the scenario side um, as opposed to trying to get a better you know fix on 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 what people are going to do and then how how do you think about what is um, better what's what's treated as exogenous um, you know, trying to model human reactions to things going on inside the model um, versus um, things which are uh, left more exogenous, say, as, um, you know, as, as, as exogenous scenario variables. And so, do you have a, do you have structures for thinking about those trade-offs? Uh, and you have, um, Jonathan or Scott? Or I think yeah, from, Jonathan. from my yeah. point of view, I, um, I think those, that's a great question. It's a difficult one, and I'm not satisfied that I'm doing this right. A lot of what I'm doing um, is a bit more ad hoc rather than a very structured thing. 
but I prefer, I like to try to um, keep the models simple initially, run scenarios, get a feel for the parameters and the sensitivity of them, and then use that to guide how much detail I add. I feel like it's really easy to get too much detail into a model and then you don't have enough data to adequately constrain the parameters. And so your mm -hmm. parameter space is so rich that you can basically make the model do anything, at which point it's rather useless. Mm -hmm. yeah. Here, here, Jonathan, you hit the nail on the head. And boy, I run into that with my graduate students time and time again. We need mm -hmm. to start simple and understand what we know before we add the complexities in or we won't understand why the model responds as it does with the complexities. So I think there are many, many other super speakers. Jim, do you want to say something? Jim Morris? Oh, I just want to second that emotion that Scott just uh, elaborated on there. Yes, um, yeah. um, too much complexity without understanding the underlying dynamics is a real problem. So, yeah, but in some cases like this social behavior or even economic system model, we don't understand the complexity to begin with, right? So mm -hmm. before we try to link these models, we need more data to understand how they behave, those systems. I think that's what yeah. Scott was getting at. Um, I, I'm a little surprised that uh, I didn't see a talk today by by anyone doing an ABM, and I'm just wondering: has that gone out of fashion, or is that still uh, all the rate? I think Jonathan stopped. Not an ABM. Uh, mm -hmm. what am yeah, I, I do a lot of ABM. That's my main modeling mode. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's. That's interesting. I'm, I've all, I've been a fan of that. Uh, I think um, I think those are fascinating models. I mean, you can. It's I I guess it's kind of like a Markov chain sort of process, right? And you uh, put probabilities on decisions um, and and run the model. I I think it's pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it really gets at being able to understand. And this is, a, I think, one of the real uses of agent-based models when you don't have enough data to constrain the system is there, I think they can be very useful for sensitivity analysis to try to identify mm -hmm. what data do you need that you don't have. And I've also been a huge fan for years. I haven't engaged in this, but watching the work that um, Robert Lempert um, has, has done and people influenced by him have done of using um, you know, massive runs of agent-based model scenarios to explore um, uh, what uh, the policy space might look like in areas where we're hugely uncertain. I think that's a very, very rich area, and lots of people are doing great work in that area. Hmm. So, so Rob, did you get the, um, I, I know you, are, you asked the question, did you get what you wanted to hear, or, or do you want um, to kind yeah, of- no, yeah, I mean, I, um, I, I suppose I would push uh, a couple of comments. Um, one on what Jonathan said. Yeah, no, I uh, um, you know, to totally uh, agree that, that you know, the, doing the many scenarios can be very useful. It's also it could be a good value of information um, sort of activity to allow you to um, um, understand, you know, where where you can really where more data can can really help. We have some. Um, uh, some of my colleagues um, working on in this area, but using agent-based models for for other uh, topics, um, uh, sub epidemiology, uh, and then some work in, in actually um, uh, uh, tax regimes. But um, um, go back and forth between the agent-based models and then um, some surveys, both local or, or national surveys, where they try to um, use the survey instruments to try to understand. Um, you know some of the key parameters that turn out to drive the model behavior. Um, but uh, I, I, I suppose I've just pushed a little bit more on um, the idea that um, one way to um, think about what is more or less important in um, these very um, you know complicated models or models that could be very complicated 
is is to think about um, um, decision relevance and think about um, you know first off the, the the parameters that are most important to to generating um, you know risks either through um, uh, you know exposure or or, or, or vulnerability um, and um, and also the um, uh, to the extent possible um, the the model behaviors um, that are most important in um, uh, you know in, in helping decision makers distinguish between um, uh, uh, different different policy choices and oftentimes the the way um, you know we try to organize the, the model work is that um, you you start with some specific policy choices on the table, uh, either specific or, or rather general, and then try to use the, the, the modeling to understand, um, uh, you know, when, when one set of policy choices clearly dominates the other or vice versa. And so with some of the, uh, you know, the coastal agent-based modeling, trying to understand, um, uh, you know, when, when, when growing risk is going to affect, um, uh, you know, people's choices where to live, value of property, um, financial flows, that sort of thing, um, uh, you know, can be very important and 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 uh, provides a, a powerful way to think about, um, uh, uh, you know, what what details are more important and what details are less important in in, in the models. Hmm. Anybody wants to chime in on that? And by the way, the, those who are in the audience, who are participants, feel free to speak up. And I have one question from uh, Richard Weisskopf, University of Miami. Do you want me to unmute you? You can ask that question, Richard, or let me see if I can unmute you. OK, Richard, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, my question is, uh, I'm an economist, so I'm interested in the, the connection between the natural models and the socioeconomic side. The question I wrote in the chat box was like this. Um, the hazards, when you estimate the hazards to people like flood damage, um, there was, I think it was Jeff who used uh, flood claims. So then the question he, he really, he, he asked, but he didn't answer it, is what if the low, especially the low income people, the people that live in small houses, that uh, maybe 20% or the bottom 30%, they don't have insurance. So they don't file. Oops. You're you, you muted again, uh, Richard. Hmm. I think we lost Richard. Okay, maybe we can come back. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, it's better. Okay, I, I didn't realize that was, okay. Um, I think it was in Jeff's paper when he talked about the, you're trying to estimate the the, uh, the, the damages to people through flooding. Okay, and yeah. if, you, if you use um, flood claims, the question is what about the people that don't have flood insurance? Now might right. be the very poorest 30% of the people. How do you get data on that? And the same thing, so there's the non-insurance people. And then if the um, harmful algae blooms invade my estuary and I don't sell my house or buy my house because the data that was used was housing sales and how the mm -hmm. price changes, right? So what if I don't sell my house, I don't buy my house, I just can't go outdoors, I end up in the hospital or mm -hmm. I can't use my boat for six months. How do we estimate those kinds of data that might affect different parts of the income spectrum that don't show up in some of the data sets that we have ready to use. This is Sam. I can answer part of that question. Go ahead, Tom. Um, the, the, the speaker raises some really good points, which has vexed me for the last 10 years. Um, <laughs> an additional... <laughs> So, and, and I think it's, you know, I'll answer it, but perhaps not satisfactory. Um, the, the claims, you're right, it's just a subset of people. We try to supplement that um, data with individual assistance claims, which is meant for uninsured uh, people 
uh, but there has to be a disaster declared, which is easier these days than, than it used to be, but still not a guarantee. Um, we can also use those, those claims and um, on the ground assessments and use um, models like machine learning models to fill in the gaps. So even though you don't have a claim because you didn't apply for one or you're undocumented, um, we can use learning techniques statistically to identify those properties with really good accuracy. But that being said, model, all models are wrong. Um, there's, there's problems with it. And I was told, and I'm, it's not my area of expertise, but over and over during Harvey, when we were writing the report, I was told in Houston alone, there are around 500,000 undocumented residents. And there's no way to, to, to capture those people. And we don't even know what happened to them. Um, and so the, the, the problem persists, but it's doing much better than just using claims. Um, I don't think it's ever going to go away, uh, but we're trying. Yeah. Right. We have the same problem with uh, Hurricane Andrew, right, uh, which went through an, um, the migrant area in South Florida. And they just people disappeared, and there were no data on who lived there and who disappeared from there. But it was a large number. But just to push on, on, on Richard's point again, which I think is, is a really good one, um, uh, is is that the you know so the way you get you know, the data you gather and then the, the 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 measures of impact you use can have a really you know powerful impact on on the results and you know, essentially the framing of the results. And there's been some really interesting work by um, uh, Stefan Holgott's group at the World Bank recently where they've been, um, and I don't think they've done it yet for coastal flooding, they've done it for riverine flooding and for other uh, for types of natural disasters. So I can send around the link. But but trying to, to look at household well-being, which they piece together from a variety of data sets. But the point is that you look at um, uh, disaster and other impacts not on a using a straight economic measure which tends to then heavily weight towards certain classes of people which is one of the you know implications of Richard's questions but use things like fraction of household consumption the effects on household consumption and that sort of thing which can um, uh, give a much more um, uh, a, give you measures of impact to both you know hazards and then responses which are much more attuned to um, uh, equity considerations and so forth. Thank you. Yeah, so I can. Thanks. All right. So any of the other speakers want to chime in now? So, uh, so I want to pose a question, you know, uh, um, I was wondering what, what you thought about the objectives of linking all these different systems of models. Do you have any thoughts on where we are, what are the gaps, and you know what kind of data gaps we have, either within your area of discipline or between trying to link these model, modeling systems across? Jeff, you want to say something? Or? Yeah. I, uh, the um, the economic um, the areas of economic activity that we're measuring with the ocean economy satellite account we 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 embarked on that work recognizing the um, the relationship uh, between these forms of economic activity and the uh, natural systems that that support them. Uh, so, some of the sectors like tourism and recreation and commercial fishing are um, very dependent on the, the health of ecosystems and, and are vulnerable to the uh, in, impacts of, of um, kind of qualitative impacts of climate change on those systems, the, um, not just the uh, absence or presence uh, of those things. Um, and, I think getting more towards you, moving in the direction of your question that our thinking was 
looking at these connections between um, the, the natural systems and then moving on a continuum to, to begin to um, uh, do some natural capital accounting, which looks at those natural systems in terms of the ecosystem services that they provide, and then examining the linkages between um, that, that natural capital and these economic outcomes uh, that we're measuring. So, so the kind of work you're, um, we're discussing today is really important. It was an important driver in our decision to focus on this, um, on the ocean economy as, as a subset of the national economy. Oh. That's good. <laughs> and, and NOAA and um, USGS um, and, and a lot of others are working together on, um, I think the Bureau of Economic Analysis and, um, and uh, EPA are, are working on uh, a project to move forward in the uh, natural capital accounting, which, you know, my, my contribution to this is looking more on the data side of, of these modeling efforts of looking, uh, providing the uh, data on the, the ocean economy that, that can be used in this sort of analysis to provide data on the, um, for natural capital accounting that, that hopefully be useful uh, in this analysis as well. And then relying heavily on the, uh, you know, the remote sensing and other um, in situ measures of of the natural systems themselves. So, so with respect to data, I, we heard today there were like, you know, there's a fairly good organized system for coastal observation system data that uh, Carl and Deborah and Tom talked about. Um, then Margaret talked about some of the ecosystem data. And I, I don't know, do we need the one system of databases or do we need to make sure all these different databases can talk to each other? Plus also, I, I heard today there are a lot more data needs than what we may have right now to understand these um, interactions and systems themselves. So anybody wants to comment on that? Maybe Margaret, do you want to chime in? Or can, do, do we need a one universal database system for? No, you need data, data systems that can communicate. And there mm -hmm. actually is, um, uh, this group might want to, if, I don't know if anyone else is involved in this. There's a group that is, a, what you would call it is the, um, Data management community for NASA, NOAA, USGS, and several many yeah. other um, groups. Um, we belong to it. It's called Earth Science Information Partners. Um, there are socioeconomic data providers in this group, um, and it's the mm -hmm. it's it's a great group of people. It's where you would go if you wanted to figure out how to link up data systems. Um, mm -hmm. So I would encourage, does anyone know of this group already? It tends to be populated more by people behind the scenes like me, although there are a few data intensive users, modelers, and um, um, you know, high powered data users who come to these meetings. They meet twice a year. Uh, their acronym is ESIPFED.org. Mm -hmm. So you can, I can, I'll paste a link in, but it's, it's um, probably the best place to find out to figure out how to hook up um, existing data systems in the earth and environmental sciences. Thanks, Mark. So I haven't, I haven't heard much from the, uh, the audience members and I see still many of them are around and I was wondering if anybody, I mean, Eric Swain, I see you, um, others have not turned on their, uh, the, uh, the mic. I, I see Victor Wang has a question, I think. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, my name is Victor Wang. I'm a postdoctoral research associate at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill uh, in the Department of Geological Sciences. So I actually have a question in the morning to Dr. Mustafavi uh, regarding his presentation. So he mentioned, uh, I'm not sure if he's still here, but the question may be also pertinent to the other speakers. So uh, my question is, um, is that 
In, in his presentation, Dr. Mustafavi mentioned using surrogate modeling approaches for modeling complex systems. Uh, um, actually, by using surrogate modeling, it basically simplifies any uh, complex systems uh, with the simple systems. Um, but when doing those type of modeling, uh, this modeling requires historical data for model calibration. So my question is, would it be a challenge to collect sufficient historical data to, uh, to guarantee or test the validity of these simplified models of complex systems, uh, such as the one for sea level rise simulation? And maybe this, this kind of question is also uh, for, for the other modeling approaches, because when we are dealing with the natural hazards, uh, we are always uh, modeling a system or systems of systems. So how can we be so sure that what we are doing is uh, really makes sense or is really revealing the reality? So it's kind of like that. Anybody want to respond to Victor? Unfortunately, uh, Ali Mustafa is not here. I think he's left, but uh, you, you can type in that question unless you have already done it. Um, we, we'll yeah, I have already done it. Yeah, yeah, okay. So Jonathan, I, I see you have a comment on, on the chat box. You want to kind of uh, comment, uh, explain that to others or maybe? Sure. Yeah, I was just saying to follow up on the comment about it being important to think about making uh, data systems um, interoperable. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, there's also there are also challenges of making modeling systems interoperable and thinking about standardizing the way that data is passed back and forth between different models as we try to couple them together. And this is particularly a challenge in thinking about um, the issues around coupling the human systems models to the biophysical models. But it also can be an issue with how do you connect different um, models of the um, biophysical environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Eric, you want to say something? Yes, yeah, so not much. I, I think there's been a lot of really good talks here. Um, I think like everybody has their own personal interest in this whole, you know, multi-scheme. Uh, the talk by John Loftus, I think, uh, already been mentioned, um, the idea of supplementing, developing data, in this case for hydrodynamic modeling, which is, which is one, one thing that, I, that I'm into, um, the uh, supplemental and augmenting the model results when you have them. I, I saw he had some examples where model results were obtained for an area but then on-site information from, from aerial information was used to augment it. There's flooding in areas. And uh, I, I did want to emphasize as a general rule, and, and I, I primarily am involved purely with the physical modeling side of things rather than the, the, the uh, biological or, or human, human impact. But um, that largely in any modeling effort, it really is a back and forth with developing a model and then getting further information about the area to compare with and supplement and you determine from the model what's missing from your information data set. That's actually one of the primary uses we have for all this modeling. I think everybody's run into that in almost any, any modeling effort. So anyway, back to what I was saying, certainly um, there's plenty of great talks here. John lost his talk on you know the operational flood forecast and the hydro models. The validation process for the model is very important. And, and the supplementing and the evolution of the model also, um, you know, it certainly is never a matter of developing the, the perfect model in the first place that, uh, you know, we, we develop models for areas. We learn from the model what we don't know, and then we go on and, and gather that for, for the information. So um, that's just a uh, general modeling rules. I think they're relevant to this and, and many efforts. Yeah, I also heard that data sharing could be an issue. I mean, a lot of times the data sharing Yes. Even among the federal agencies could be an issue. And I heard, I thought I heard that. Yes, I, I think I, I, I agree. I'm sure it's different problems in, in different locations, but I think there's a lot of data being collected. And this court fits in exactly with what I'm saying is having the most fun information, being able to double check your, your modeling efforts. Um, I think particularly uh, individual projects in areas develop individual data sets. And often this is not something that's widely 
you know, in some, um, there's no single primary database. So uh, and I think somebody had already already mentioned, you know, you're working on something and you don't realize a certain model data set even exists in your area, which can be very helpful in, in, in supplementing uh, what you're doing. So I don't know, and I think somebody threw out the idea of, um, do we need one large, I, get, I don't know it's really practical to have very large databases that has everything in them, but certainly data availability and access and ways of finding the data, I think should be prioritized as well. Mm -hmm. Scott, I think it's time? very important to recognize that it's not just between federal agencies, but also when private industry gets involved in data collection, as it has in the last couple of decades, that becomes problematic. It becomes problematic because, first of all, if someone wants to acquire the data, and they haven't put in place an automatic server, then they immediately need to figure out who, how they're going to pay the person hours to recover the data and get it to you. And then mm -hmm. secondly, even if it's in their contract that they're supposed to share the data, if they see a proprietary benefit that gives them an edge, they're gonna do what they can in order to keep that data within their organization. Right. And then if the business goes out, if, if they go out of business, then all bets are off. And there's a good reason why our founders established such organizations like USGS to maintain data mm -hmm. um, acquisition and delivery, as well as NOAA, as well as other agencies. Right. And we need to be a voice to that. Mm -hmm. But one, one advantage, being, being in the U.S. Geological Survey, it's, it, we do tend to have the data when we're doing a project using modeling. We have the data, at least the USGS data, um, right there with us in the office, so to speak. Uh, just that, as you say, there's many other data collection, data collection sources that can be used. And we work with, with private agencies as well. Uh, primarily, where is their priority on getting the data to somebody else when you request data? why would it be their priority at some some you know private entity uh they'll get you the data i suppose at your at their convenience but nobody there is putting a high priority oh make sure that this other group gets the data they need for their what they're doing okay so we have about 15 minutes left before four o'clock i was wondering um sparkle did you have anything else you want to bring up uh uh, yeah, so quickly, a few things I've been thinking about. So I noticed that there were some issues with maybe some of the social data that would be really useful to have, but there are individuals who aren't captured by different types of data that's being collected. Has there been real effort to think about what types of systems do capture the types of information that you'd like to have? Like if you need to move to some kind of social media platform, how to get that data, how you'd like it to come from that platform, or if you needed to develop a tool that was um, useful on that platform to collect the data that you would need. Is anyone doing any of that type of work? Wow. Sparkle, that's a good question. Is that Richard? No, that was my question. <laughs> yeah, right. okay. That's Sparkle. I'm glad you picked up on it because I'm dealing with Lake Okeechobee. I'm dealing with the Everglades. I mean, I'm dealing with an agricultural area that's 90% uh, undocumented. Nobody likes to tell where they're from. No one, no one likes to answer questions. No one will, will take, they don't participate in the census for sure. So yeah, it's, we're talking, as you mentioned in other parts of the country, Texas, we're talking hundreds of thousands of people, or at least in parts of Florida, it's 50,000 to 100,000 people in the workforce that are undocumented and their families. Mm -hmm. So this is a, not a, it's not a trivial omission. It's not yeah, purposeful. and I also think that it's not trivial in terms of millennials and being involved in the gig economy. They also live at home. And so their income information is not being captured by a lot of different systems. And so I'm pretty sure that a lot of the traditional systems and ways of getting this information is yeah, really yeah. incorrect. Mm -hmm. <coughs> wow. I have an so, idea. Obi, Obi, if yes. this were a meeting and we were all together, we would see each other. 
But right now we only see four or five people on the screen. Is there any way that you could un, not unmute everybody, but un, that, that we could see everybody and you could oh, see? No, it, it's, it's up to them to turn on their video cam, but you know, some. I don't think we can. Some, can we do uh, that? Uh, yeah. We can ask everybody. Yeah, turn on. Uh, I see Rory, Tom is back on. How do you do that? So we have a Richard request from Richard so we can see everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I can't on mine. How, how do I do that? Just you have a video cam. Oh, yeah, down there at the bottom. All right, yeah. there it is. So I guess now that we are seeing everybody, I was, you know, what, what is, I don't know, what is left of you know this session. Oh. Um, how do you think we should continue this discussion? Because I think we brought together. You know, typically we meet only the biophysical folks get together in a meeting and we talked about great models that we they all have and we have, you know, behavior, social behavioral folks get together. So this is our effort to bring all these different disciplines together. And I was wondering if anybody, uh, you know, on this, um, in, in this meeting right now, how do we continue this discussion? How do we, how do you um, have this continuing discussion among our groups? Because um, I think we all agree that that's an important aspect to see how uh, humans interact with the environment or natural systems and the economic systems and interact with both. So, and, and identify the data gap. So I'll just open it up for comments or suggestions. How, how do we come continue this discussion? I mean, one thing I would say is just that um, something like exactly the NSF's call for um, COPE research hubs is the kind of um, opportunity that would facilitate continuing this type of engagement. Okay. Great suggestion, Dr. Jonathan. Anybody else? Did, Deborah, you have any comments or ideas on? Right. Yeah, go Sorry, ahead. Then. Did you ask me a question? Uh, no, I was wondering if you have any comments. You probably heard all the discussion. Do you have any comments? How do we continue this kind of discussion? From um, my perspective, um, this is a pretty big group, apologies, with a pretty uh, broad set of um, issues uh, that um, could be maybe parsed out into uh, working groups or community of practice if there's some issues folks would like to collaboratively try to scope and address um, was my mm -hmm. one thought there's already a um a, a coastal coupling uh, community of practice um that kind of got touched on today um if folks uh want to connect into that i could provide access to it it's managed by noah um mm -hmm. But that was my one thought that um, maybe some sort of ongoing listserv um, mm -hmm. or, um, network, if there are sort of higher level um, research data accessibility questions that folks would want to pursue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? Feel free to speak up. Uh, Scott, do you have anything you want to say? Well, I just wondered if along the lines of what Deborah was just saying, if you might want to try to figure out how to form a couple of subgroups and maybe do some literature review papers to describe the state of the art and, and what we need to improve upon it. Mm -hmm. I think that in idea. many of these areas, there is an opportunity and there would be a benefit from that, but maybe I'm not familiar enough with some of the literature. It's a good idea. Anybody else have suggestions? Yeah, this is Tom. Yeah, I just want to just want to second what uh, Margaret had said and, and put in the chat. Um, about uh, ESIP, I think that's a really good uh, forum in terms of discussing and, and learning about data management techniques and capabilities. 
Mm. And ESIP, I could just put another plug for them. They actually also operate listservs and regular meeting times for their clusters. So it's a, and they tend to be a lot, they start out very informal. So there's, a, um, I don't want to call it, say low expectations. When you start out as to what it is you're going to produce, you can work it out on the way. Mm. Uh, but it's really, I find it a really great place to go, very rewarding. Um, and, and you can always find people who are interested in your problem. So do you, do you all think it's any value in having this kind of, uh, I know this is a larger group conversation on a regular basis or like, you know, reconvening this after let's say two or three months to see we can make progress on some of these issues. Is there any value in having us talk again at some point? Obi, I think that burden is on your shoulders to pull us together again. I bet, yeah, I bet a lot yeah. of these people would. Yeah, I, yeah, we could explore that in mind. Uh, somebody else was speaking. Yeah, Jim, this is Jim Morris. I think the next meeting ought to be face to face in Miami. <laughs> okay, that was our plan, isn't it? I'm in the beautiful Biscayne Bay campus, right on Biscayne Bay. That's where we were going to have it. <laughs> uh, the COVID wow. kind of stopped us from having it. That yeah, that's a good idea. Um, so, uh, Sparkle, unless you have anything else, what I thought was we could wrap this up. I want to remind everybody about the survey that we sent out. Mm -hmm. And also the speakers, if you don't mind, if you can send me the PDF version, unless you have already done that. And let us know if, if it is OK for us to put it on the website we already have that you have seen. Mm -hmm. um, and also the speakers, if you have a short bio that we can include that in the website. We might keep it for a while, so especially if you have another meeting. Uh, but we also will have to write a report for the NSF uh, project. This is funded by NSF for this workshop. Mm -hmm. um, and this idea of a paper might be a good one, I think, like Scott suggested. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're willing to participate in that, you know, that's another. Uh, you know, thing you can indicate if you're willing to be part of that review paper. A, a particular thing we ought to, I mean, I'm a civil engineer myself, but we need to get more engaged in the kind of work that Jonathan does in terms of social behavioral mm -hmm. type modeling. And maybe some of you have already done it, like Rand has done, right? Rob was saying. Mm -hmm. um, so any last minute thoughts from Rob or anybody else? Um, just a lot of no. This was a great meeting and a lot of exciting, lot of lot of exciting work, and okay. good to see the connections forming between it. Great. Uh, Sparkle or Mike, you have anything you want to add? Or? Um, no, just that I'm interested in continuing some of these conversations about data needs and where we should be thinking about getting this data and how we should be getting the data. Okay. Um, I guess I was I going to say that it, it never really hurts to talk. I mean, it's the way we kind of advance and make some progress. And not only that, get to know each other a little bit better. And that right. helps our overall collaboration and so forth, too. Right. Uh, you know, kind of regarding further advances, I kind of get the impression that uh, you know, it's going to take people trying different things and seeing what rolls out and uh, kind of advance that way in terms of linking with social models and so forth and socioeconomic models. That's kind of right. my expectation. Mm -hmm. So, Simon, do you have Thank anything? Thank you, Obi, and everybody at your, yeah. everybody Simon. at FIU for putting this together. Yeah. Okay, let me uh, talk. Maybe we can wrap this up. Uh, unless, Simon, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, so go ahead, Shimon. No, I, I, it was a very interesting uh, discussion, and uh, the meeting went very well. I don't have anything in particular to say. So. Uh, 
right? So let me let me thank uh, you know all the speakers for taking time and, and being there. I apologize for all the technical difficulties we had. So I want to thank all 17 speakers. I think they were great presentation, very valuable. Um, you know, as as we, I think we all agree on that. Also, I want to thank all the people who actually came to this meeting. Uh, you know, at different times we had different numbers. And I also want to thank the organizing committee. But uh, finally, I want to thank Maria for Maria Pulido for helping us to put this together and, and making sure it was running smoothly. Thank you, Maria. Um, all right, unless there is any other question, it's almost like three minutes to four. Um, we get to leave a little bit early, which is a good thing, I think. Um, I guess. Um, all right. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. It was great. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you.